Good morning, everybody. You're all very welcome to our inaugural annual seminar of the Irish Cancer Prevention Network. As with so many events this year, we've had to amend our original plans um, and make this a virtual event. I'm sure um, you've all gotten used to doing these virtually at this stage and having many meetings this way. So um, we really have been delighted with the registration for this event and the amount of interest. Um, it's really great to see that amount of interest and commitment um, to the concept of prevention of cancer in Ireland. So just to introduce you to the Irish Cancer Prevention Network very briefly, the founding members of the network are Breakthrough Cancer Research, the Irish Cancer Society, um, the Marie Keating Foundation and the National Cancer Control Programme. And all of these will be represented on um, the panel when we get uh, to the Q&A session at the end of today, so you'll have a chance to, to meet everybody. Um, and just a special thanks to the Recruiting Foundation for hosting the webinar on Zoom for us today. It's much appreciated, and especially to Helen Forrestal, who's looking after everything behind the scenes for us today as our Zoom host. So I'll just mention a couple of housekeeping things. Um, I should say I'm Dr. Trina McCarthy from the National Cancer Control Programme, a Director of Public Health um in the nccp and i'll be chairing the um session today and introducing the speakers to helen as i said was in the background looking after the technology for us um and as you'll be aware as an attendee you won't be able to um to speak or to share your video so you don't have to worry about that um but we do want you to be as involved as possible and you'll see a q and a button um on your screen so if you click into this um, and type your questions um, for us. And what I'd recommend is if you put in your questions as you think about them really, um, we won't ask them at the end of each um, presentation. What we'll do is we'll keep them and bring them to the panel at the end of the, um, the full session. And then you should also be able to give a thumbs up to a question if you see someone asking a question that you'd also like um, answered. You can sort of vote that up along the system as well. Um, and then also just to remind you that the webinar is being recorded. So after the event will be circulating in the evaluation form and then later on details of how to access um, the recording of the event as well, um, as well as um, those of you who would like to have a record of it for your continuing professional development, we'll do that. So just um, to briefly outline the agenda here for you. So the vision of the Irish Cancer Prevention Network is really to harness our combined efforts to reduce the burden of cancer in Ireland. And in today's meeting, I will just be really setting the scene very briefly as to what are the potential gains we can make through cancer prevention. We'll have a short address from Antishik um, Mihal Martin, and then we're going to focus on four, we've, we've chosen four topic areas to look at in this session today. So we have tobacco, obesity, um, HPV vaccination and alcohol. And then our last speaker, Anya Ling, will speak more about the Irish Cancer Prevention Network and give you some more information about um, the plans of the network and also in particular for those of you who'd like to get more involved. So I just am going to introduce um, the speakers to you and some of them will be well known to you already, I'm sure. Um, and just give you a little bit more detail on our um, key speakers today and then I'll of course introduce them as they're about to present as well. So first of all, Dr. Fenton Howell, who um, has done such tremendous work in tobacco control in Ireland. Um, he has been on the board of Ash Ireland, the Tobacco Free Research Institute, the European Network on Smoking Prevention, and more recently was the National Tobacco Control Advisor to the Department of Health. And he's also chair of the local organising committee for the World Conference on um, Tobacco, which is going to be coming to Ireland, which is very exciting. So we'll have Fenton talking to us about tobacco and cancer prevention. Professor Donald O'Shea is the national lead for obesity within the HSE. So he was featured on obesity and cancer, and he has looked at areas such as um, the benefits of um, the taxation on sugar sweetened drinks that you'll remember and chaired the Department of Health Policy Group on Obesity. 
Dr. Abby Collins is a consultant in public health medicine in the HSC and the National Cancer Control Programme um, and she is also a member of the National Screening Advisory Committee and she has a background in genetics as well as medicine and her other interests include cancer prevention, early detection, immunisation and screening. Dr. Sheila Gilhini will be talking to us on alcohol and cancer in Ireland and is the current CEO of Alcohol Action Ireland. And of course, we're very proud of our public health alcohol bill um, in Ireland. And um, Sheila's role now is, you know, really looking to see how we can implement that. She has a background in physics and was previously over the Institute of Physics in Ireland. Um, we look forward to hearing her presentation and then finally Anya Ling is Cancer Prevention Officer at the NCCP, the National Cancer Control Programme as well. Anya is a trained public health practitioner um, within the UK faculty and she is looking to implement the cancer prevention recommendations within the National Cancer Strategy. Um, she's a key role in terms of both establishing and um, the in establishing the Irish Cancer Prevention Network and liaising with their other partners. So Anya will be focusing on that in her talk later on. So just to bring you back then to um, the brief run through I'm going to do is really to give you an overview of cancer in Ireland, um, the potential that we have for prevention and also I suppose I want to just make sure um, those people who've joined today will be um, committed i'm sure already but just to point out as well the necessity of prevention and um, what will happen if we if we don't do anything about it and how important it is so if you look at our rates in terms of our age standardized rates, rates and put all the cancers together it doesn't look too bad if you look over the decades some cancer rates have have increased and some have decreased the real challenge for us is that because we have an aging population ireland had a very classically um young population. So now that we have a, an aging population similar to other developed worlds, worlds this is where we see our actual numbers um, dramatically increasing and this is um, where the huge pressures are coming from, both in terms of the pressures on the health service but also the human implications in terms of the um, burden of cancer on individuals themselves and on their families. From the um, cancer registry here we can see their projected um, increases based on the, uh, primarily on the age population and the current trends in cancer. And you can see here that by 2045, for many things, we'll see that, you know, the cases double potentially. So this is something where we need to look and see, look, what, what can we do to, to change this? You know, we've made other, other great strides in, in different areas of health and are there things that we can do, not just about treating cancer, but about tackling it at the root causes. So in terms of the overall cumulative risk for an individual by the time they get to the age of 75, if you include non-melanoma skin cancer, which um, tends not to be life-threatening, even though there's a quite a large volume of non-melanoma skin cancers, looking at the others, you know, a man has a cumulative risk of one in three and a woman one in four. But what we want to focus on today really is the fact that 30 to 40 percent of those cancers are preventable. And Anya will be outlining sort of a lot of the collated evidence in terms of um, the, the evidence behind um, the fact that, that so many of these cancers are, are um, preventable. We'd also point you towards the International Agent, uh, Agency for Research in Cancer and the World Cancer Research Fund. And then on, in individual talks, I'm sure we'll have a little additional focus. But I'm just going to do a whistle stop tour in terms of showing you Looking at the estimated annual incidence there on the right from um, the cancer registry, so these are estimated figures, but looking at those, which risk factors I suppose affect which cancer. So this is the total number of cancers, but for example, with tobacco, it would nearly be easier to make a list of which cancers, the, you know, it's not involved in, but just to highlight, you know, the broad range from individual risk factors across different cancer types and what the potentials are. So the potential there for obesity for example across a broad range of cancers and in some you know the the risk factor will be responsible for a very large portion so for example in esophageal it's up to a third of esophageal cancers in, in men and women can be linked to excess weight and um, but esophageal cancer you'll see isn't the 
most ca common cancer. So actually, while it's maybe a smaller proportion of bowel cancer or breast cancer, the overall impact can actually um, be greater. With alcohol, again, a broad range of um, different cancers that um, are affected, especially the upper airway, digestive tract and the liver. And again, breast and bowel, while it's a smaller proportion, because as you see, there is a, quite a large incidence, then there is quite a large potential to impact. Infections, we have HBV, hepatitis B, and then H -pil um, hepatis, uh, he chronic hepatitis infection, and then H. pylori in terms of stomach cancer. So again, um, it's a global problem and to other infections in other countries, but even within Ireland, we have potential. Um, and, you know, it's been very exciting with HPV vaccination to be able to get to a stage where the WHO was talking about elimination of cervical cancer. So that is what Abby will be speaking about later on today as well. And physical act inactivity then in particular, that's, you know, the protective um, ability of physical exercise um, to reduce people's risk of cancer. And again, that's looking at breast cancer, bowel and endometrial. And I'm not going to mention other types of radiation, but in terms of individuals' exposure to UV radiation, non-melanoma skin cancer, which I mentioned earlier, is huge, huge volumes and real, um, you know, very, very preventable cancer in terms of reducing people's cumulative exposure to UV radiation over their lifetimes. And similarly, melanoma is the um, fourth commonest cancer in terms of invasive cancers. And it is one which unfortunately does result in loss of life far too often. So again, UV radiation, whether it's environmental exposure or whether it's um, artificial exposure from sunbeds is um, one which needs to be tackled. And it is one of those where, you know, it's not really dependent on the age profile of our population. We've actually seen the rates going up regardless. And finally, screening we often think of in terms of early detection and trying to diagnose a cancer at an early stage, whereas there are huge benefits in terms of identifying precancerous lesions. So a screening test that identifies something before the cancer itself has developed. So I wanted to include that here as well in terms of cervical screening, identifying something which is a lesion that hasn't developed into an invasive cancer and can, uh, can genuinely prevent cervical cancer occurring and similarly with the detection of polyps through bowel screening I think it's a really important one for us to acknowledge here as well. So through our talk today um, what I wanted you just to think about this doesn't have all the answers here by any means but as we go through um, the different presentations and as we think about what we can do as a network um, the first thing I wanted you to think about is, well, what do we know about the preventable causes of cancer? Um, are there things we don't know? Um, do the right people know this information? And are we, are, you know, are we all you know, very much looking at the, the correct evidence? Um, secondly, do we know what works? So if we know what causes um, a particular cancer, do we know how we can influence that? And usually there are like lots of, there could be different times at which um, an intervention will, will work in terms of either at the government level introducing legislation or is it changing your environment? Is it one-to-one -one interventions with individuals in terms of behavior change through motivational interviewing? Do we need to put systems in place like that? Are there screening um, tools available? Um, it's, it's to do with community empowerment and how do we change behaviour there? And, and also, are we doing enough in terms of evaluating the efforts that are happening in cancer prevention so that, um, so that we know what, what genuinely works or doesn't? And then finally, the, the most challenging one of all is, is how do we make it happen and what do we need to do um, you know, with our, our own workplaces or as a group? Um, how do we take what we know will work and make sure it happens? And is it just about being informed or is it about having to um, advocate more widely? Is it working together? Is it persistence? Is it all of these? So I think there are a lot of lessons from the talks we're going to hear today as to what has worked in the past um, through cancer prevention and how we can take that and apply it to, to other areas of prevention. I think there'll be great, great gains to be made. So that's all I wanted to say in terms of setting the scene. Um, I'm going to just um, show you now a pre-recorded um, statement and a, a address from Antisha Kneehol-Martin 
who, as you remember, will have been um, very involved in the time of the um, Public Health Tobacco Bill, which Fenton will be talking about later. So I'll just show you this brief address from um, Neil Martin on T-shirt. Steve Galair, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to address this conference today, knowing that its deliberations will be of such value to so many. I want to acknowledge the efforts of all those involved in organising the conference and would like in particular to thank Orla Dolan, Chief Executive of Breakthrough Cancer Research, for inviting me to speak. Conferences are a bit different these days, but they are no less important in bringing people together and setting out a shared course of action. I am really impressed by the ambition and breadth of the work of the network, and I understand how vital your role is. Cancer reaches across every part of our country and into every family. The Irish Cancer Prevention Network forms part of a broader effort to address the root causes of one of the deepest health challenges of our time. That task of prevention is a moral and social imperative and is the cornerstone of the National Cancer Strategy. The introduction of the smoking ban in 2004 was a seminal moment in Irish public life. The Irish people took the lead internationally in protecting workers and transforming workplaces. It wasn't easy, but it's a reminder of what can be achieved with political drive and a commitment to evidence-based public health. It's an example of what combining our ethical values with the hard facts and a bit of leadership can do. My government is committed to that kind of energy in confronting the root causes of cancer that continue to blight so many lives. Smoking, alcohol abuse, unhealthy lifestyles and skin exposure are the main roots of the disease. The National Cancer Strategy will be the primary engine of our efforts to fundamentally tackle those underlying causes of cancer. Cancer screening is also a very important part of cancer control in Ireland. Thankfully, we have been in a position to begin a phased restart of the screening programmes from last July with the re recommencement of cervical check. Bowel screen resumed the issue of invitations for screening on a phased basis from the 4th of August and breast check is expected to resume in the coming weeks. The Healthy Ireland programme is a further important initiative and is taking a population-wide approach to encourage and support people to live healthier lives and to reduce the prevalence of cancer risk factors. Ultimately, building a healthy society with active lifestyles and good diets is at the heart of our national effort to prevent cancer. Your network has a pivotal role to play in that nationwide work. Ongoing investment in research is vital to gaining insight into the causes and treatment of cancer. Research over the years has been pivotal to the advances in cancer treatment and survival rates. That powerful combination of our values, science and leadership at every level will help to reach our shared goal of fundamentally tackling the causes of cancer. I wish you well in today's conference and most importantly in your ongoing work. So our thanks to um, Tijuk Michal Martin for taking the time um, to put that address together and I think it's um, it's great to know that we have government commitment um, behind this as well. Um, I'd like to invite Dr Fenton Howell now to start um, to share his screen with us um, and to um, present to us on smoking and cancer prevention. Um, as I've mentioned already, uh, Fenton has most recently worked as the National Tobacco Control Advisor to the um, Department of Health, but has, uh, prior to that, a very, very established um, background in tobacco control in Ireland, um, working with ASH Ireland, the tobacco, um, a tobacco research institute, etc. And um, he's going to give us a, a great flavour today, I'm sure, of um, what's happened uh, both past and present, as well as planning for the future. And uh, it has been a great uh, coup for Ireland as well, having the uh, conference coming shortly. So I'll pass over to Fenton now, thanks. 
Good morning, everybody, and thanks very much, Katrina, and thanks everybody uh, for, I suppose, checking in today. We've done thousands of presentations in the past, but this is the first webinar one, so hopefully it would all go well. So first of all, to put things into a little bit of context, as Trina was talking to us earlier, when we look at the whole issue around risk factors, the Global Burden of Disease study published in The Lancet in 2017 tells us that just about 40% of cancer deaths and disability adjusted light years <clears throat> are attributable to risk factors. And that's huge in many respects when you think about cancer right across the board. To look at that in the Irish context, we don't have the data just yet to tell us what fractions of cancers are attributable to modifiable risk factors. But we do know that the NCRI, the National Cancer Registry, will have a publication out at the end of this month or the next month with that data for us. In the interim, we can look at what happens from our near neighbours. Here's a paper published in 2018 looking at the situation right across the UK. 38% of all cancers have a direct attributable factor to a risk factor. And then down on the left hand side, you can see these are the top 10 risk factors and tobacco smoking dominates right across the board, encompassing 15.1% of all cancers. And you can see the picture for obesity, radiation, alcohol and infectious diseases of which HPD is one. If you look then at the mortality profile and the impact of that and what it means here in Ireland, overall, we have about 30,000 deaths every year in Ireland, of which 6,000, almost 20% are due to smoking. 15% of CVD deaths are due to smoking. A third of malignant neoplasms are due to smoking and 40% of respiratory diseases are due to smoking. And this data comes to us from colleagues in the HSE, Paul Kavanagh, Martina Blake, and Ashley uh, Sheridan in the State of Tobacco Control in Ireland. And then if you look at this, the pie chart on the top right-hand corner, you can see of the 6,000 deaths from smoking, almost half of them are as a direct result of cancer. And that's a big change in what we used to see 10, 15 years ago. It used to be a third cancer, a third CVD, a third respiratory. But uh, we've got better at managing CVD and got better at managing respiratory diseases. Unfortunately, we haven't got better really at managing tobacco-related cancers. So that's why that percentage has grown on that pie chart. If you look at the bottom pie chart on the right hand corner, what you can see of the almost 3,000 deaths from smoking, cancer deaths, almost half of them come from tracheobronchus and lung, and that's what the population know about in general, but almost the other half come from an additional 14 other cancers that smoking causes. So it's a significant problem that we face. And the news doesn't get better at one level because this data from the most recent annual report of the National Cancer Registry puts it into perspective for us. The six major cancers with the lowest five-year survival, five of them are tobacco-related. So we now know that smoking causes lots of cancers, and if you have a smoking attributable cancer, you don't do very well. So what, where are we going with our smoking trend and what's the picture for the future. This slide sort of shows the smoking prevalence in Ireland since the turn of the century. We've dropped from 35% current smoking to 17% daily for adults and we've had even a bigger success story with children down from 20% down to 5%. But the thing to bear in mind as well that less well off and disadvantaged populations have almost a double the smoking rates as their counterparts. So what we know is that smoking causes lots of cancers. You don't do very well on them. And there is a huge health inequality issue there. Some of the bubble points there show some of the things that happened along the way to help us reduce the level of smoking down to our current 14% or 14% daily smoking. And they didn't happen by chance. And this is, I suppose, the first big issue in learning from the past, planning for the future. This slide shows a huge number of national strategies of different types. 
The green ones are the national health strategies we've had over the years. The red ones are tobacco specific ones and the purple ones are cancer ones and the rest are a mismatch of other issues in it. And in all of those, some element of tobacco control would have been mentioned in them. Unfortunately, not enough in some of them, but you take what you can get. One of the things that you learn over the years, if things don't appear in national cancer strategies or in national strategies, it is difficult to get them on the agenda. So one of the things I think we need to make sure we do into the future is to make sure that tobacco control or smoking control or risk factor control is an integral part of every national health strategy, irrespective of what it is, because it does matter. This slide sort of shows a, a progression of some of the major developments we've seen in tobacco control from really the 80s right up to most recent one on standardized plain packaging. And I'm going to cover one or two or two or three of them, sort of to outline where we can learn from these as we move into the future. An important issue as well is understanding policy effectiveness. And that can be extremely difficult to do to try and pull out what impact did this policy have on smoking or on alcohol or on obesity or whatever. And my, my good friend and colleague, Professor Luke Clancy, for many years has worked in this area. And this recent publication shows the contribution that various uh, policy issues have had in helping to reduce smoking over the period we talk about. And importantly, you'll see that price contributes to greatest proportion of, of support to reducing smoking levels. And in, throughout the World Health Organization, they would say to everybody, if you as a country do only one thing on tobacco control, make sure it's price. So looking at price as an issue and looking as, you know, this doesn't happen by chance. As you can see, there was no great difference between the nominal and real price of cigarette products back in the late early 90s. But with a lot of advocacy and commitment from a lot of the NGO sector and the health sector, we've managed to increase the price of tobacco significantly and to widen the gap between the nominal and real price of cigarettes. And I think, you know, it's important that we see this move up. And as it currently stands, smoking or a packet of 20 costs about 12.70 to 13.50 in Ireland. But those things don't happen by chance. It requires a lot of work into the future. So what we did in the past needs to happen annually to, to ensure we keep that picture going. On Taoiseach did speak about Ireland going smoke free in 2004. I suppose the impossible did happen. Smoking when it was banned out of all bars, restaurants and all workplaces. And as he was right, it probably had a bigger impact outside of Ireland than inside of Ireland, because it absolutely accelerated the way for smoke free to be brought around. We met many delegations from many countries, and I was never sure whether we should be pleased or annoyed when they'd say, well, if Ireland can do it, anybody can do it. But anyway, that's for another day. And credit goes to where it's due. Two people, the late Tom Power, who was the first CEO of the Office of Tobacco Control on your left, and Minister Michael Martin, who was probably the only person who risked losing his job if this didn't work. And I suppose this statement that he made on that magnificent day in Wagamama restaurant, which was a smoke-free restaurant at the time, when he said, I'm making the call the way it must be made 11 months from now, taking tobacco out of the workplace completely and for good. And that's exactly what happened. How did it happen? This slide is the final slide that I've used in the past on an almost hour long presentation of how the smoking plan worked in Ireland. But in essence, it's distilled down to this. On the one hand, you had Ash Ireland, which was the lead NGO on tobacco control in Ireland, talking about smoke-free workplaces. You had Tom Power in the Office of Tobacco Control. You had Minister Michal Martin, who was open to it. And to use the phrase, if we all stayed in our bubble at the time, nothing much would have happened. But each person, Ash Ireland, mobilised its constituency, 
Pam Power mobilised the opposite of battle control. Michal Martin mobilised the political system. And as you can see, there's names there from Fine Gael, Alan Shatter and Gay Mitchell, Liz McManus from Labour, John Gormley from uh, the Greens, Tom Kitt, who was equally a Fianna Fáil, Mary Henry was an independent senator. All of them came together, all of them worked together to overcome the might of the Vintners, the tobacco industry and the restaurateurs who strongly oppose this, as well as some politicians. So that's an issue, I suppose, we need to learn from the past and planning for the future. The importance of people sort of putting aside their own self-interest and working together for a common good. Mass media campaigns are also extremely important. And again, sometime around 2010, 2011, the HSE made a strategic decision that we needed to professionalize how we manage mass media campaigns. And working in conjunction with lots of partners, they developed that whole one every two smokers campaign, which has grown since. For those of you who aren't sure, the guy in the middle of that photograph, the good looking guy, that's me. But more importantly, the person beside me on my right hand side is Fidelma Brown, who was the head of public communications in the HSE, who has made this happen really in a professional manner that has changed how we do mass media campaigns into the future. The most recent issue that we developed in Ireland was the introduction of standardised packaging for all tobacco products, following on from the lead that we got in Australia and followed by the UK that we brought in standardised packaging. And how did we do that? Again, not much different to how we did bringing in smoke free in 2004, except it sort of extended out further. We had more international NGOs and public service and politicians involved in it. And in particular, the children's NGOs, which were really brought in by the Heart Foundation and the Irish Cancer Society, made a big difference. And it, again, everybody worked together. Everybody agreed with how our priority should be to ensure that we overcame the might of the tobacco industry as they challenged us through the courts in Europe and beyond. And it was a big challenge. And I suppose what's important to look at is, and I think this is an issue, I suppose, that will bring into the future. We're only seeing the start of this. The whole idea about plain packaging was to bring in a, a way of stopping the tobacco industry from using the cigarette pack as a billboard. Here you had three packs of cigarettes, Camel Blue, Silk Cut Purple and Marlboro Gold. And I'll let you try and think for a minute which is which, but the idea of plain packaging was to stop the industry from using color, from using fancy design, from using lovely packs to attract smokers. Equally, it was important that we would have an ability to get the message more clearly out to people about the harms of smoking and how and where they could seek to get help. And I think we achieved on all grounds, on all of these, and the impact of those will be into the future. So these are the ones you wouldn't have known that, you know, now, but in the past, it would have been pretty obvious. Marlboro would have been the gold pack, Camel Blue would have been blue, and Silk Cut Purple would have been purple. Smoking cessation is another important issue for us as we sort of learn from the past and plan for the future. Even if nobody else ever started smoking again, we have over three quarters of a million people in Ireland smoking who will die of tobacco related diseases unless they quit. And then over the years, we've seen the importance of moving that forward. The HSE has been trying to coordinate smoke and cessation by pulling together a multimedia response in both how it provides cessation services on the ground uh, through social media, through the quit lines, through Twitter or whatever. All of those things are extremely important. Paul Cavanagh and colleagues from the HSE have been working hard with the National Clinical uh, Effectiveness Committee to develop evidence-based clinical guidelines for practitioners in smoke and cessation. And those hopefully will be going out for public consultation in the not too distant future. The HSE, along with Cancer Society and others, target high-risk groups on smoke and cessation. An important issue is the whole development of making every contact count, 
where we train frontline healthcare workers in smoke and cessation, but in other risk factor diminutions as well, like alcohol, like diet. These are really important issues that we have underway, but we need to make sure that they work into the future. We need a regulatory framework for nicotine products. These were underway uh, prior to the fall of the last government. And thankfully, the programme for government now that we have picks up on those so the Department of Health can work on those. Building on HICWA's HTA in 2018 and the Department of Health commissioned the HRB to do some evidence-based reviews on issues around e-cigarettes, which again would be published later on this year and the necessity, obviously, to invest in mass and social media around these issues is important. So our current trend, can we get to less than 5% by 2025, as is our strategy? Well, it's an ambitious goal, without a shadow of a doubt, and it's going to be difficult. But then again, so was bringing in smoke-free in 2004, and so was bringing in standardised packaging in 2018. Our current strategy document, Tobacco Free Ireland, sets out what some of the things we need to do. It's been in existence since 2013. It has over 60 recommendations on them. Many of them are uh, implemented. Many of them need to be implemented as we move on, like increasing the price of tobacco every year. That doesn't change. But importantly, it sits very well and it's coherent with other strategies in this area. It's coherent and at one with the Healthy Ireland whole of government approach. It's important that it's also coherent with what's going on in the EU with tobacco control. It's coherent with the World Health Organization's Framework Convention on Tobacco Control and its global plan for NCDs. And it's coherent with sustainable development goals. And that's an important issue. And if we look to see how have we been doing against best practice, if you look there on the top right hand corner from the WHO best buys, you might see that we are actually implementing all of those issues that are talked about there in that top panel. And we need to continue to implement them as well, because it doesn't stop. You need to keep them moving. We need to certainly improve how we've done on the whole cessation issue, and hopefully our clinical guidelines will help us there. And we need to do those other measures at the bottom as well, from an international perspective as well. So as we plan for the future, as I said, one of the things we've learned, make sure your policy issue is in some programme for government or it won't get done. Our shared future 2025 is the one that came out in June. It talks about increasing the excise duty on tobacco over the years ahead, which is positive, and bringing in some sort of taxation on e-cigs banning the sale of nicotine inhaling products and bringing in a licensing system, which were part of the, which are part of Tobacco Free Ireland, have been brought back into this, uh, and hopefully we'll see legislation bringing that forward into the very near future. On the right-hand side, I think we need to really get real about these issues, shifting the money spend. Non-communicable diseases account for 80% of healthcare spending across the EU, yet less than 3% is spent on prevention. This is something I think we all need to jump up and down about a lot more to try and change that. We need to focus on the real problems. Combustible tobacco products kill 6,000 people every year in this country. We should not let anything else distract us from that. We need to roll out Tobacco Free Ireland and plan its successor using best evidence internationally. COVID-19 and its impact, we just don't know what it is, but we were not sure how it's impacted on smoking, but we have to measure those things. We need to look at how we behave internationally with our illicit trade protocol, stop tobacco industry influence and policy, work with the EU on the revision of new directives, and look at Brexit and its impact, because it will have an impact. Losing the UK, I suppose, the Department of Health colleagues in the UK were core in Europe, at pushing forward tobacco control, so they'll be sorely missed. And then in conclusion, we need to remember that smoking and cancer prevention is both a big P and a small P political issue. It's very important because smoking causes lots of cancers, the outcomes are very poor, and it impacts significantly on the less well-off. It is a strong supportive evidence base, it's cost-effective, it requires a lot of advocacy and political engagement, 
the good thing about it is that it succeeds when nothing happens. The beneficiaries of prevention are statistical non-victims. We all know who gets lung cancer, but who do we, do we know that somebody didn't get lung cancer because they didn't smoke? It demands teamwork between and across governments, and it requires a strong, committed, informed, and active Irish Cancer Prevention Network, which I hope you all engage with. Thanks very much for your attention. And back to you, Katrina. Thanks, Fenton, for that really um, inspiring talk, I think it's fair to say. And um, in terms of demonstrating the, the power of collaboration, I think yeah, you couldn't really put it any more clearly than that. Um, I'm going to invite uh, Professor John O'Shea to start um, sharing his screen um, now. And um, before he starts, I just would like to remind everybody that um, there is a Q&A button there um, if you want to ask any questions. We're not going to put any questions to Fenton on his talk now, but please, um, if you put them in there before you forget them later on. Um, and as I said, Fenton and all the other um, speakers will be joining us on the panel at the end for questions and answers. So I'll pass over now to uh, Dr. Don Moshe, who I said is the HSC lead um, for obesity. Um, thanks, Don. Okay, and uh, Trina, you're seeing my slides clearly there, yeah? Yep. Good. Um, so, uh, thanks a million for the invitation to uh, talk this morning, uh, and it's fantastic. I mean, one of the upshots, I guess, of, of uh, doing webinars is access is, is easier and the reach uh, wider than maybe we would have had with uh, previous meetings. So it's fantastic to see so many people uh, participating. Um, so I'm going to talk about obesity, uh, I'm going to talk about cancer, and I'm going to talk also about the model of care which we are currently finalizing uh, for obesity so that we will uh, once and for all get, uh, I suppose, to grips with treating obesity. Uh, I think these figures are important. Um, just to put the overall context, I know we are in the middle of a pandemic and it's a pandemic that uh, we're going to be living with COVID-19. Uh, there are people talking about post-COVID and so on. We're, that's not happening anytime soon. But if you look at the number of deaths from COVID-19 to date in Ireland, uh, that's where we stand. Uh, there's been, at the same time, from obesity, 2,950 deaths. Um, cancer is ahead of that again with uh, close to 6,000 deaths. But obesity is sitting there as a major driver of mortality. Forget about morbidity, mortality. Um, and obesity does that. It's now clearly linked with over 200 uh, conditions. And the links uh, representative of this kind of heat map uh, are... Uh, you know, the, the, the size of the um, circle and the color of the circle uh, represent the uh, strength of the association. And the association is either strong or very strong for the majority of these conditions. And esophageal, colorectal cancer, postmenopausal breast cancer, endometrial cancer, all strong associations uh, with both uh, causation and outcome. The world has changed a lot. So the next slide is at Bondi Beach in 1970. Um, and it would look very different now. Um, you probably would have a lot less people. You certainly would have a lot more uh, overweight and obesity. You certainly would have a lot more sun protection. Uh, you know, so if you learn uh, about the risk factors, uh, then uh, and you explain the risk factors to individuals, then people will change behavior. Not everybody, uh, but lots of people will change behavior. Uh, there's also a lot more conversation here. So there would be a lot more head downs into devices. Uh, there's a lot more uh, eye contact here. So it's a big change. In the last 30 years, what's happened to obesity uh, is at a population level, it's doubled from about in Ireland, 12% to 24% in the adult world. But at that same time, the body mass index over 40 uh, or severe obesity has gone up sixfold and the body mass index over 50 has gone up 1200%. So we've had an explosion in the extreme end of obesity. And that's been driven by a 
toxic environment that's been referred to by Fenton in, in his presentation. So this is Coca-Cola's most successful campaign ever, their names on bottles campaign, which they claimed was not targeting uh, in any way, shape or form under 12s, uh, who were the main drivers of, of getting their parents or grandparents or minders to get them a bottle with their name on it. Um, and we now know that these sugar sweetened drinks drive obesity. Uh, products and placement, so the eye line is the byline, so ice creams for three-year-olds are now available at the eye level for three-year-olds, the same for the dairy products. When you move to the fruit and veg section, uh, a child doesn't pester for sprouts or broccoli, so you don't have displays at eye level there because uh, the products won't shift. Our understanding has changed enormously, so we now know that adipose tissue is highly dynamic, uh, it's immune regulated and it's protecting your energy store. Uh, so if you look at this slide, this is adipose tissue real time uh, and the black areas are the lipid filled adipocyte, but the blood vessels, the stromovascular fraction that's running uh, in between the uh, lipid filled adipocyte is full of immune cells that are telling the adipocyte how to behave. So when you're uh, post a meal, it's helping you store energy. Uh, when you're pre-meal and, and uh, in an energy deficit, it's gently mobilizing energy. Uh, and these cells are communicating with each other in a really concertina uh, fashion to run uh, adipose tissue as the dynamic organ it is. When adipose tissue becomes overloaded, uh, you, what you see is just lipid is filling your adipocyte, the blood vessels are squeezed, and there's just no activity uh, worth talking about in terms of communicating uh, between uh, the immune cells and the adipocyte. Um, and, and at that stage, uh, when your adipocytes are overloaded, uh, really the engine is blown in terms of looking at uh, a, a kind of a, a linear weight loss in response to, to lifestyle change. I want to briefly take you into one of the cells that's inside an adipose tissue is the natural killer cell. And it's a really important cell in terms of anti-cancer effect, in terms of responding to uh, vaccination. And there are, you know, a million of these in every 10 mils of blood that we take uh, if you take a blood sample. So, but you can now look at how these cells are behaving. And, and this is a natural killer cell doing its job. The first thing it does is it carries out an assessment. Is this friend or foe? Have I seen this before? Do I need to uh, let it go on about its work? Or do I need to kill it? And, and vaccines work by programming uh, natural killer cells to uh, recognize the threat and kill it. And, and uh, so if it decides it needs to kill, what it does is it um, perforates the cell it wants to kill and injects a uh, injects a kind of a toxin called granzyme into that cell. And the next slide is a better example of that where you have a natural killer cell uh, looking at a muscle cell and then injecting granzyme. And you can see the muscle cell in vitro just disappearing um, in response to the granzyme. So what happens in obesity? Well, we can look at inside NK cells in obesity and you can look at the RNA uh, expressed by uh, these NK cells in the setting of uh, obesity. And this is a heat map. This is what you get back when you do these studies and it's, you need a bioinformatician to tell you what is going on. But basically everything that's above in red above the black line is down-regulated. Uh, granzyme is down-regulated, perforin is down-regulated. So your machinery for drilling and injecting your toxin is down-regulated and your machinery below the line uh, in red is upregulated. And what's upregulated when you look at the RNA is a whole load of genes for handling fat. And, and why is that? Well, it's because our NK cell is taking up excess lipid in the setting of obesity because fat needs to be stored in cells. It's very dangerous when it's left free. So, Every aspect of natural killer cell function in obesity uh, is impacted on. Uh, the number of natural killer cells is reduced. 
their machinery is uh, shot in terms of killing and it's trying to handle excess um, lipid. So we're, we're, we're used to the concept of fatty infiltration of the liver and fatty infiltration of um, muscle, but you're actually getting fatty infiltration of your immune system that's compromising its function. And, and uh, you know, that's undoubtedly explaining uh, in part why we are seeing a range of cancers and a range of other conditions. We're also understanding that um, adipose tissue, apart from being dynamic and, and immune, that, that helps us understand why there is difficulty with, uh, you know, just simply eat less, move more, and, and you'll lose weight. Uh, that's not the case. We know that weight is not a behavior. Uh, weight is something that your body protects in a very dynamic way. And there is a, an adult set point for body weight that's very tightly defended. Uh, we even within the medical profession, there is a big view that people who are living with obesity should just eat less and move more and they would lose weight in a linear fashion and they'd be fine. Uh, that's not the case. That's like saying stop smoking is the treatment for your lung cancer. Uh, the treatment for your lung cancer is the treatment for your lung cancer. And the stop smoking is good for your general health and should underpin the treatment for your lung cancer, but it's not the treatment. Uh, and we need to make that step change in our thinking. Because we know this from all the studies that have been done on weight regulation over the years, 90% of people, the weight gain is 90% irreversible. Uh, there are that 10% outliers, some of whom won't lose weight at all when they eat less, move more some of whom uh, will be able to lose weight in a linear fashion and possibly keep it off. But the majority of the slimmers of the year who appear on the front of a magazine having lost six stone, uh, you go back to them two years later, they are back to within an ounce of their peak uh, body weight. The flip side of this 90% irreversible for 90% of people is that 10% weight loss or five to 10% weight loss is associated with significant health benefits in the area of diabetes, heart disease, cancer, which is today's topic, uh, and general life expectancy and quality of life. Uh, so it's a very reasonable and, and vital target uh, when you're sitting with an individual who is living with overweight or obesity. But what is the patient's experience uh, of, of living with overweight or obesity? Well, this tends to be what it is. They've had a lifelong struggle with their weight, uh, often. Uh, they have social and emotional challenges as a result of that. The health consequences come in early adulthood or late teenage, uh, if, if the obesity is a major challenge. Uh, but there is a shame, uh, and there is a shame because of the stigma. Uh, and therefore there's a reluctance to engage with the medical profession. And, and this next slide was given to me by a patient to describe his shame spiral. And it's almost a universal uh, report uh, when, when people um, attend our clinic uh, that really they have felt judged uh, when they meet a healthcare professional. Uh, they will often, some will tell you they've lost three or four kilos before going to their GP. And the first thing the GP will say to them is, well, you really need to lose some weight. Uh, they don't ask where, how, where are you with your weight at the moment or can we discuss your weight? Uh, and for patients, it can change if they come across a healthcare professional who says, actually, we understand things better now and we're gonna do things differently now. So um, let's have a think about how it is for you and what we can do to, to improve your situation. So behavior change does underpin the response to treatment. So just like stopping smoking is important for your um, overall health in dealing with your lung disease. Um, so lifestyle change is important for your treatment for your obesity to work and work in a sustainable way. And we need positive language. We need a huge attitudinal change in line with the science. Uh, and we need consistent messaging within our team, keeping the patient at the center of it. 
at all times. What I want to do now is, in, in, in the last few minutes, is move on to the model of care for obesity. Um, and the model of care for obesity is at its late consultation phase and was in consultation phase through August and, and September. Uh, and, and the backdrop, you know, to, to reiterate, uh, do we need to treat uh, obesity? We absolutely need to treat obesity because currently what we're doing is we're treating all the complications of obesity and we're not treating the obesity. Uh, it's almost a unique scenario um, and, and uh, we're treating the diabetes. It would be like treating the retinopathy and nephropathy uh, in, in diabetes without treating the blood sugars. Uh, you know, it's, it's uh, just no longer acceptable, thankfully. So we need an approved and funded model of care. Um, what is a model of care? Well, it's a one-off document. Uh, it's high level. It's not prescriptive about the treatments, but it's about the structures. And, and uh, Fenton has been all over this uh, through the years of, of dealing with the um, kind of uh, smoking uh, situation. Um, it's not a clinical guideline. It's the top level aims. The road to the model of care uh, involves uh, some of the documents uh, that have been mentioned already. But if you look at uh, the Obesity Task Force, which was launched in 2005 by the current Taoiseach, uh, and, and, and uh, I think I'm hopeful now that he is uh, Taoiseach, um, and we have a previous Minister for Health um, as Tónishta, and we have a Green Party leader as the other uh, leader in government, uh, who wants active transport, I'm really hopeful that we will get progress on treating obesity within the lifetime of this government. And crucially, and I didn't include it, but when Fenton was speaking, uh, obesity has been mentioned in the programme for government as an area that needs to be addressed. Um, and, and as you'll see later, has been mentioned also uh, in, in one other document, which I think is really important. Um, so the National Programme for uh, Obesity Management was set up in 2017, really with a view to uh, developing a, a model of care. Uh, and what does the model of care look like? Well, it looks like other models of care that, that some of you will be familiar with, uh, but it's basically a whole population approach. This is the model, it's a pyramid of care, where you have uh, health promotion and community programmes available uh, across the community, uh, right up to the apex of the pyramid where you've got people living with severe and complex uh, overweight and obesity uh, that need care uh, in, in the hospital setting. Um, and then either side of the pyramid, you've got the twin towers, as I kind of call them, of uh, policy and legislation to you know, affect change in the environment and then education and training on the other side so that uh, when an individual engages with the healthcare system, uh, the person they're dealing with uh, knows how to approach the issue uh, and how to begin dealing with it in a way that isn't going to alienate the individual. And again, the adult level uh, or the adult pyramid is the same. It's that pyramid of care with, from the health promotion in the community right up through to access to bariatric surgery. Public policy and legislation, uh, that's around the advertising, the sponsorship, uh, you know, the food labeling and calorie posting. So calorie posting uh, since 2011 has been a government priority, but the food industry have so effectively lobbied and opposed and uh, delayed that it's still in that legislative holding bay and not over the line. Uh, food labeling uh, has been a complete victory for the food uh, industry, uh, executed via their influence of politicians in Europe to vote against a traffic light labeling uh, of, of foods so that people uh, would have a clear message about, yeah, not too much of this and a little more of that. Uh, the fiscal measures, I mean, if you want an example of um, effectiveness, the sugar tax has been magic 
uh, a tax on sugar sweetened drinks has led to an immediate reduction across Europe in the sugar content of most sugar sweetened drinks uh, to a level that will bring it below the next tax threshold and for some beverages to a zero content uh, of, of sugar. So it, it works um, and we have to use it as, as the blunt but very effective instrument that it is. Uh, so uh, level zero uh, are the population wide measures um, and that really is initiatives like parenting programs for children, healthy food made easy, park run, the various website information that, that needs to be really at the right level. Level one is the primary care team. And again, we heard mention of making every contact count. This is going to require the development of a weight management uh, module within MEC that everybody in all health disciplines is trained uh, in um, because the messaging needs to be repeated and needs to be consistent and needs to be empathetic. Uh, level two is enhanced primary care where people with overweight and obesity have access to a multi-component uh, weight management service. Uh, and there are pockets of excellence, but they're very small pockets and it needs to be uh, nationwide and, and close to the patient. Uh, there's the way to go as a, a children's program that has been uh, trialed in the community. And everything that we do here is going to need to accumulate the evidence as we go. Uh, level three in the adults is the establishment of multidisciplinary weight management centers within each of the regional health areas under Slauncher Care, uh, so that you've got equitable access for people with severe and complex obesity. And on our pyramid of care, nowhere does a BMI cutoff or a weight appear, because it's the degree of complexity that needs to be managed. If you happen to have a BMI of 44, you may be fit, have no metabolic problems, and uh, not be bothered by it. Uh, but you could have a BMI of 32 and have type 2 diabetes and sleep apnea and require um, uh, bariatric surgery. So uh, it's, it's, if you like, a sensible uh, individual uh, model. Uh, the level three for children and young people, uh, they will be referred into secondary care within their local and regional pediatric uh, units and a decision made about onward referral to, to level four. And then level four is over the next three years, a plan to establish four multidisciplinary bariatric surgical centers, three adults and one within CHI uh, to, to deliver the peri and post-operative care for those who, who need it. And uh, we, we want to be doing 600 surgeries per year in adults by 2023 and up to 20 surgeries in adolescents would be uh, what's estimated to be required. So that's what our model of care looks like. Uh, it's a pyramid with the twin towers of environment and education on either side of it. It's no good if it's not implemented. The other document that obesity has been mentioned in is the HSE corporate plan. Uh, and and to, that's been kind of shortened from 2020 to 2025 to back to 2023 because of COVID-19 and the fact that uh, we can't really think beyond three years at the moment. I have to think it's not unreasonable. Um, but there is a, a, an assessment being carried out into the, the model of care and we've engaged with Department of Health and HSE about the investment that's going to be required. So obesity is driving not just cancer, but a range of chronic diseases. Uh, the model of care is coming uh, and close the consultation period is now just over. Uh, obesity is in the corporate plan and a priority within Slauncher Care. Uh, we must prevent and treat in driven by the facts uh, and then, then you won't go wrong. Uh, and stigma and judging people with obesity remains the greatest obstacle to securing funding and, and implementing a model of care. So thank you very much for your attention uh, and I will end screen share and pass back to Katrina. Thanks, Donald, and I'll invite um, Abby Collins to start um, sharing her screen there, but uh, just to thank Donald again for a, a great overview there of um,
the the I suppose the biology involved in obesity and and then of course the the plans within the HSE for the the model of care and we've had a good few questions coming through so thank you to everyone for um using the the Q and A function there and we'll um bring those to Donald and the panel at the end um so now I'll pass over to Dr Abby Collins to speak about HPV vaccine and uh, cancer prevention thanks Abby. Okay. Okay. Do I have sound? You have sound. Yes, we can hear you, Abby. And we'll I've just got the in. crucial, the crucial <laughs> button. Apologies. Um, thanks very much for that, Trina. Uh, and I'll say apologies for the sound. Um, so yes, I'm going to talk a little bit about HPV and the HPV vaccine and cancer prevention. And as a jobbing public health doctor, it's um, nice to be able to talk about a different virus for once and one in the context of a vaccine. So um, uh, we'll see how this goes. Okay. So I'm going, just going to give a brief overview about HPV, talk about the HPV vaccine, the cancer prevention opportunities that HPV vaccine um, affords, the impact of the HPV vaccines that we've seen um, globally, and the HPV vaccination program in Ireland, to just a brief summary of that. So in terms of HPV, HPV stands for the human papilloma virus. It's a non-enveloped double-stranded DNA virus, and it's very common, and there are over 100 different types identified. It affects the cutaneous and mucosal epithelial, and there are approximately um, 30 to 40 types which infect women and men. HPV is virtually ubiquitous. Most people will be exposed to HPV at some stage if they have any form of sexual activity. HPV infection is the most common in people in their late teens and their early 20s, but most people will never be aware that they have the infection, they don't get any symptoms of the infection, and the majority, 9 out of 10, will clear the infection themselves within two years and never be any the wiser that they had it. But we know that sometimes HPV infection persists and it can cause warts, particularly genital warts, and, and or cancers, which is of grave concern. So there are two groups of HPV infection uh, and they're split up really into the low risk types which cause um, the genital warts, the HPV 6 and 11, and then the high risk, the oncogenic types which cause various um, different cancers, of which HPV 16 and HPV 18 are the most important. And it's persistent HPV infection, particularly with HPV 16, but also the other oncogenic types that's responsible for the cancers um, that we experience of the cervix, some of the oropharynx, the penis, anus, vulva and vagina. So this slide really looks at the different um, relative contributions of HPV to the different um, cancer sites that we know HPV is associated with. And you can see here really the overwhelming um, prevalence of HPV 16 amongst all the different types of cancers. HPV 18 is then um, the next most common uh, and then the rest of the oncogenic types have some impact which together all um, comprise a large um, majority particularly for cervical cancer but it's the HPV HPV 16 that is the most problematic for us. So in terms of the vaccines, there are three vaccines currently licensed by the HPRA and the AMA to protect against HPV disease and those are Cervarix and Gardasil 4 and now more recently Gardasil 9. So Cervarix protects against HPV 16 and 18, the two predominant oncogenic types, but doesn't protect against um, the genital warts. Gardasil 4 protects against the 6 and 11 required for the genital warts and for 16 and 18 the oncogenic types and Gardasil 9 has that wider um, protection against more HPV subtypes which are oncogenic. Now the vaccines can be used equally in males and females and from the age of nine years old. But we know, as with most vaccines, you get your best immune response if uh, you have your vaccine before puberty and at the youngest sort of age around that time. And also best if you um, have your vaccine before you have exposure to HPV. So Gardasil is currently used in over 100 countries worldwide, including 25 European countries, the US, Canada, Australia and New Zealand. Over 100 million people have been vaccinated with Gardasil worldwide. Approximately 300,000 people vaccinated in Ireland too. 
So the HPV vaccine safety has been studied for over 14 years and over 1 million people have been studied during the clinical trials since the vaccine was licensed in 2006. And it's important to remember that pre-license there are extensive safety and clinical trials and to evaluate whether it should be licensed at population level. So it is one of the most extensively studied vaccines or um, medicines uh, of all time. And the vaccine safety data has been reviewed by the EMA, the WHO uh, and the CDC because as I'm sure you're aware there's been um, significant media concern over recent years uh, as to the safety of the vaccine so it has been extensively interrogated the data that we do have. No country has raised any concerns about the safety of the HPV vaccine as a national signal. So in terms of cancer prevention opportunity, it's estimated that approximately 4.5% of the global cancer disease burden is due to HPV. Now that's probably a little bit um, higher than it'll transpire to be in Ireland, but at, at global international level, it's about 4.5%. And in terms of um, pitching that against other, other factors, excess body weight and um, alcohol would be of a similar level, a little higher, but of similar level. So it, it's an important, it's an important um, factor on the, at the global stage for cancer. So the burden of HPV related disease is substantial in Ireland with an average of 538 HPV associated cancers diagnosed per year in men and women. Approximately three out of four are in women, one out of four are in men. Cervical cancers cause the most common cancer caused by HPV infection, accounting for about 300 cases. And oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinomas are the next most common, accounting for about 133 cases. Um, so in terms of HPV cancers in Ireland, um, looking at the um, cervical cancers, about 300 women are diagnosed with invasive cervical cancer each year. Um, of these, about 260 are preventable by Gardasil 9. However, before we get to the diagnosis with cervical and cancer, there are uh, the precancers um, that the cervical screening program uh, looks up, uh, looks into. Uh, and this affects around 6,500 women each year. So although the number of actual invasive cancers that we get to are, are somewhat more modest, the large number of the 6,500 women is very significant. And whilst these are pre-cancers uh, and they are treated very successfully across the country with, uh, through the colposcopy units, it's still deeply unpleasant experience for women to go through. It's a deeply worrying experience and there are ongoing issues that some women um, suffer from as a result of those treatments, um, particularly uh, for onward obstet obstetric um, indications. We also see about 90 deaths from cervical cancer each year, uh, and about 75 of these would potentially be preventable through Gardasil 9. In terms of the cervical cancer, I think it's also worth noting that the survival, uh, five-year survival is about 61% for it, um, but the average age of diagnosis is 46 years and the average age of death is about 56 years. And I think that's really important just in terms of um, understanding the impact that it has on the family and family and community life, because it's really taking a woman at a very young age in her life when she's often caring for young children and elderly adults too. So. Uh, no cancer is a good cancer, but spiral cancer certainly isn't either. Oropharyngeal cancers are, are an increasing problem as well. Um, just slightly less than half of the oropharyngeal cancers that we have annually can be attributed to HPV uh, and potentially preventable by Gardasil 9 and about 24 um, deaths attributed to HPV 2. And again, these are nasty cancers. They are very disfiguring cancers. They're very difficult cancers to be managed and for people psychologically to manage the impact of those two. And I think over time, it's fair to say there has been a change um, with the profile of the oropharyngeal cancers that have been seen clinically. Traditionally, they would have been slightly older men and traditionally with uh, histories of tobacco and alcohol um, usage, whereas they are now increasingly being seen in, in younger men and HPV associated. So in terms of the other cancers, well, there, there is others 
significant sort of cancers that the HPV vaccine can prevent against, um, cancers of the vulva, of the anus and the penis particularly, and reasonable numbers of those cases and deaths can be prevented, uh, and also uh, cancers of the vagina and the rectum. Um, so these aren't necessarily large um, numbers of, in terms of actual cases, um, but again, they are very disfavoring um, cancers. They have huge psychological impact and they have huge functional impact in terms of the treatments that are required and the impact that it has on people's lives. Uh, so this is a slide that I took from the recent um, HICWA HTA uh, on uh, HPV, HPV vaccine and uh, whether it should be made available for men too and for boys too as part of the school program. And I think really it just shows nicely uh, the proportion of the cancers that exist uh, amongst male and females uh, and uh, how we can uh, impact on them. And you can see here the huge impact um, for cervical cancer and the huge number amount of protection we can do there but also for the oropharyngeal cancers there are significant gains and it does also highlight that really the gains a lot of the gains are amongst the female population rather than the males so what are the impact of the HPV vaccines? Um, well, we started, uh, Australia started vaccinating back in 2007, uh, and they really have done a huge amount of work in terms of the vaccination program and in terms of then rolling it out equitably um, to include boys. They've had good uptake of it and they've analyzed their data really nicely. And they saw quite early on a 90% reduction in gentle warts in, in those under 21 years because they used the Gardasil 4 vaccine, so they had that protection there. Uh, and they also had a 50% reduction in high-grade CINs in girls under um, 18 years old. Um, so this was um, one of the early papers that came out looking um, at the impact on the genital warts, which is an area where we can expect to see uh, the, the quickest impact to see was their efficacy at population level. And you can see, see here very nicely the sharp decrease here. This is the decrease in women under the age of 21 years who were directly protected and vaccinated with the national um, HPV vaccination program. You can see the impact, the herd immunity there that um, was experienced by the boys um, who were having sex with the vaccinated women. And you can see the absolute um, lack of impact then for people who were um, not part of the vaccinated cohort and, and all men having sex with men who were obviously not benefiting from the vaccinated younger female cohort. Um, so this evidence came out uh, quite early on, 2011, and bearing in mind the um, Irish vaccination program and many of the European ones didn't get started till around 2010, and this early on gave us really nice data about what we can expect in terms of impact. And again, looking at some of the Australian data, you can look for the high-grade cervical abnormalities. And you can see here was where the HPV vaccination program commenced. And we can see this lovely decreasing line here um, for those less than 20 years and, and the decreasing line here for those 20 to 24 years in terms of the high-grade cervical abnormalities. Um, so we've affected the warts, we've affected the precancers, uh, and so we should make marked impact on the cancers in time. Scotland has also run a very successful program and analyzed and published their data very nicely. They started vaccinating their um, schoolgirls in 2008, 2009 with a very high uptake of the vaccine, over 90%. They had a large catch up program for older girls too. So although um, they were va vaccinating by cohorts, those who were sort of age 12, 13, they did have a very large catch up program. So enabled uh, a good number of older women, older girls to be vaccinated. Um, so they saw that the prevalence of HPV 16 and 18 plummeted as soon as the vaccine was implemented and they saw also some cross protection with um, other oncogenic strains that weren't included in the, that weren't part of the Gardasil um, Elsevirix vaccine at that point, um, which was good news. So in terms of looking at um, some of their data, um, they have a unique health identifier and they can match back the screening to the vaccination. And they looked at 138,000 women born between um, January 88 and June 96 and who had a smear test recorded at the age of 20. They identified about 64,000 who were unvaccinated women, about 68,000 who were vaccinated. And so they could compare the unvaccinated women to those who were um, part of the vaccinated cohort. Um, and they found that there was an 89% reduction in, in prevalent CIN3 or worse, 88% um, reduction in CIN2 and 79% reduction in CIN1. And importantly, they've got nice tight confidence intervals. So this gives us um, good reassurance that this is um, nice, robust data. 
They also um, could determine, because they had their catch-up campaign, they could look at the vaccine efficacy. And it really um, showed that the younger age at vaccination was associated with increased vaccine efficacy. And that's really important. It aligns with what we know, but it proved it really nicely. So the younger age of vaccination uh, worked really well and is definitely the age that we should keep trying to vaccinate um, people at. In terms of global HPV success, well, there's been various publications done and systematic reviews undertaken of those articles to look at the impact and effectiveness. Uh, and they show a 90% reduction in HPV, 6, 11, 16 and 18 reported. Again, that nice reduction in genital warts, uh, big reductions in the high grade cervical abnormalities too. So what about the program here in Ireland? Well, the HPV vaccine program was introduced in 2010 with Gardasil 4, um, and the current schools program was ex expanded to include vaccination for boys uh, in 2019-20 academic year. And Gardasil 9 is the vaccine that's currently used. So the National Immunisation Advisory Committee here in Ireland, which is hosted through the RCPI uh, and encompasses a multidisciplinary group of healthcare professionals with um, knowledge and experience in the vaccines and the diseases that uh, those conditions are caused by. Uh, and they recommended the vaccine for men who have sex with men too. And this is currently available through the SDI services. So it's a, the program in general here is a school-based program. It's given to first and second year students who are offered the vaccine. Uh, it's a two-dose schedule. It started off initially being a three doses and then proven that two-dose schedule was sufficient. You need an uptake of approximately 80% for herd protection uh, and this was readily accepted um, from the outside and outset and we had high rates of vaccine uptake. As I'm sure many of you um, are aware, um, there was a high profile sort of media campaign, anti-vaccine campaign um, with regard to the HPV vaccine that it caused significant side effects for young girls across a whole sort of spectrum of symptoms really. Um, but it, it, it caused huge concern amongst uh, teenagers and their parents and the decision to vaccinate. And we can see that that was really borne out in 2015 to 16, we got the, uh, the first flare and flag that something was not going well with the vaccine uptake reducing to 70% and certainly over the second doses a lot of the school teams on the grounds would report that they were having difficulties and there was significantly more concern out there. Then in terms of um, 2016 to 2017 uh, the uptake reduced down to 15, 50% so a dramatic decline and dramatic concern. So at that time, there was a lot of um, angst as to what to do and how best to respond. Uh, and a whole multidisciplinary group of people really got together to show their support. And the HPV Vaccination Alliance was formed. Uh, and this did huge work to try and promote the safety of the vaccine, promote the, uh, the need for the vaccine, uh, and promote the advantages for particularly girls um, to have the vaccine. So um, a very positive, a positive uh, alliance was formed um, from the fall off on the HPV vaccine. And the Mary Keating Foundation, the Irish Cancer Society, the Cancer Control Programme, and, and I suppose all initially started and flagged by the National Immunisation Office, all worked very hard together to try and turn that tide. But I think there'd be no, no story about the HPV vaccine internationally at this stage that shouldn't include um, Laura Brennan, who was a young girl from um, County Clare, uh, who was diagnosed at the age of 24 with an invasive um, cervical cancer. And she spoke very articulately, very eloquently, very passionately um, about, her, about her treatment and about her disease, and that her, her disease is vaccine preventable and she didn't have the opportunity for the vaccine but she wanted to ensure that no one else and no one else's family had to endure what she was uh, and they should have the vaccine and she very much spent devoted the last 18 months of her life to campaigning for an um, increased uptake of the HPV vaccine and uh, really really uh, did huge work internationally but particularly in Ireland for that and we can see the impact of that there so down from the 50% we've seen a gradual um, increase as very steady and significant increase in the uptake of the vaccine. Now obviously we don't have um, the 2019-2020 data um, because there were huge impacts from the COVID-19 and there's big catch-ups programs for all the school vaccines happening um, at this point. 
but to turn that tide in terms of global vaccine hesitancy, to turn that tide in a country um, so swiftly is quite unusual and quite um, remarkable. And the, the huge efforts of the school vaccines um, vaccination teams on the ground, the huge efforts of the National Immunisation Office and Dr Tom Barrett and Dr Brenda Corcoran, uh, and overwhelmingly the input from uh, Laura Brennan have really turned that tide. So let's work together and support the simplest cancer preventing behavioural intervention that we have really, two doses of a vaccine, you can't, you can't say fairer than that in terms of the impact that it can have and I suppose as per the HC campaign and the girls slogan, please protect our future. Thanks. Thank you for that Abby and um, just while you're closing up there I'll ask um, Dr Sheila Gallini to start to share her screen. Um, and again, just to thank everybody for sending in questions on Abby's presentation and Abby, we'll give those to you at the uh, questions and answers session um, at the end. Um, so we've, we've had a good few questions coming in on all the topics, which is great. Um, and she is okay to screen share you are. It's great just as you're getting set up there again. So just to introduce again, um, Dr. Sheila Galini, who's the CEO of Alcohol Action Ireland. And can I just check that we can hear you okay, Sheila? I hope you can. You are perfect, yeah. Thanks, over to you, Sheila. Thanks very much, Trina. And thank you very much for the opportunity to have uh, a word with um, all of our participants here today about alcohol and cancer. Um, just a, a little bit about our own organization. Um, we're an NGO, uh, we're an advocate who are working to reduce alcohol harm. Um, I have only recently, well, just over a year and a half now, joined the organization, but uh, it's been in existence since 2003 and we have a small staff, but we've worked extensively to really, I suppose, try to, put forward policy measures, uh, very much working with uh, what the WHO would recommend, uh, with their best buys, and to highlight, you know, what those policy measures, what they could really do for, for Ireland. Um, it's probably no surprise uh, to anybody in the room or the multiple rooms around the country that um, Ireland has a problem with alcohol. We have a high level of alcohol consumption, um, in a technical term, 11 litres per capita per annum. Um, but if we look at it actually just, you know, what does that mean in terms of the numbers of people who are drinking? Well, you know, uh, 2.48 million people are drinking at least. Um, but actually probably what we want to concentrate on are those who are drinking harmfully, and that's more than 54% of those who drink. And what I mean by harmfully is drinking in a way that uh, is above the low risk guidelines um, that would be advocated by the, the, the HSC. And there are a number who are dependent drinkers and you know we're, we're familiar with that as a story, but I actually really want to concentrate more here on what I would say this larger majority of us who are drinking and the impact that that has on, on health. Um, well, those impacts actually, they're huge uh, and there's lots of different ways you could, you could measure it, um, whether we're talking about the impact on, on our healthcare budget, something like about 12% of the budget goes on alcohol related um, hospital discharges, whether we're talking about um, the impact on intensive care beds, I'll just mention this because of the recent COVID thing, um, whether we're talking about ED and presentations uh, there at the weekend, 30% or so many deaths we think around the order of 2,790 deaths every year attributable to alcohol. There's the impact on families which is absolutely huge but I suppose what we want to just talk about here today is what, what has alcohol got to do with cancer <clears throat> and uh, as Trina would have mentioned <clears throat> excuse me earlier uh, you know there are a number of different types of cancers which um, which are caused by alcohol. I've just listed them out there. I'm not a medic myself, so I'm not going to go into the, the medical kind of reasons behind that. But suffice it to say, it has a huge impact. And uh, just one particular statistic I'll pick out there is responsible for one in eight breast cancers in Ireland. And I think that's something that um, is quite shocking to an awful lot of people. I know when, when the HSC ran uh, their um, awareness campaign and they you know, highlighted this particular thing a couple of years back ago. I had so many people that I just talked to on an individual basis said, I really never knew that. I just never knew that that could be, be the case. And you know, when we're talking about alcohol as a class one carcinogen, it's not just that you have to be taking huge amounts of alcohol for it to have an impact. Actually, at that kind of you know, fairly low level, one to two drink, uh, drinks a day level, there is an impact. And as I say, most people aren't aware of this. 
um, there was a Cancer Research UK study there a couple of years back ago, and uh, this is from the UK, but it's no different, I would, I would suspect, here in Ireland, that just 13% uh, would have identified alcohol as cancer causing. So we know we have a problem with alcohol uh, here in Ireland. Um, why is that the case? Um, well, I suppose we would say ourselves, we can, we can see, we look around, there's low prices. It's widely available. We can get it in any supermarket, corner shop, um, pubs when they're open, and I appreciate they're not at the moment, but it is very, very widely available. Allied to that is the massive marketing, and I can only use the word massive because there's a, the alcohol industry would have a budget, something of the order of about $1 trillion worldwide that's spent on, on alcohol marketing. And that has an enormous impact, and I'll come back to that. And we're in an economy which is, you know, very liberal. And um, in this liberal economy, we have this absolute Goliath who I would say would generate myths. And they're very much pitted against uh, a public health David, a very small, Organ, small organizations, the NGOs, but also within the health service, it, you know, alcohol prevention, it tends to be at the, I would say, the lower end of, of what's known and what's needed, uh, you know, out there. So I just kind of come back, what could we do? What, what would be possible? How could we actually turn this around? And I suppose what I'd be saying is, we have this thing called the Public Health Alcohol Act. Uh, I know many of you here would be familiar with that. But, you know, its basic aim is to reduce the, the level of alcohol consumption in Ireland by 20% over a seven year period. Now, it has been a long time in the making, um, literally now decades at, at this stage. But it was passed back in October 2018, and uh, there are 12 major sections to it. I won't go through it all, you can, you can see some of the things there, but they're all about actually trying to use what the, um, what the WHO would call, call the best buys. What are the best things that we can do? And the best things that we can do are to reduce availability, to have controls and pricing. And I was very interested actually in Fenton's um, uh, comments earlier on about you know, the smoking, that actually if you did nothing else, if you can, can put um, regulations around pricing, you will achieve something. So if I kind of concentrate on three particular things that haven't yet been implemented. So uh, um, in the act, there is now legislation to say for a, a, a number of, of ways of, of you know, bringing about these restrictions, but sadly, we've yet to see them actually being commenced. And if we go back, actually, as we look at this, and see just where we are about the three of them. And that's really the focus of my talk over, over the next um, period. So there is a myth that alcohol prices in Ireland are high. Now it is true you can go into a shop and if you like, you can buy alcohol, you can buy very expensive alcohol, but actually you can also buy very, very cheap alcohol indeed. Um, we do a survey in our own organization every year. Um, I'm within myself, it's great, great crack actually going around different shops and actually just pick out the cheapest alcohol. And it's incredible what you can actually find. Um, in our survey, we would have seen that um, Irish men, uh, if we were drinking at the low risk guideline, which would be 17 standard drinks in a week, you could actually do that for about 7.65. And women whose uh, guidelines would be about the 11 standard drinks a week, they can do that for under a fiver. So that's pocket money prices, very, very cheap indeed. And you'll have heard many times from the alcohol industry about high excise rates in Ireland, but in fact, actually, if you look at those excise rates and look at, at the consumer price index, back in 2002, uh, up until now, we can see that the excise rate on beer has increased by just over 13%. But com the consumer price index over that same period is 22%. So you get more for less. And we have, there's, there's lots of economic arguments that can kind of go into it. But the basic line is that actually alcohol is available here at a very low price. It's very affordable. So one of the things, as well as um, excise duties uh, as, as being a means of price control, but a particular element of price control is a thing called minimum unit pricing. And what that does is it says that alcohol cannot be sold below a certain base level. And that's very important because at the moment, you will certainly have supermarkets who will sell alcohol very, very cheaply. Um, and they do it as a loss leader. They're actually selling at a loss to themselves. They're absorbing a lot of the, the cost of the excise or the VAT that, that, that would be there. But if you re, we were to introduce minimum unit pricing, there would be, a, 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 say, a base level beneath which you couldn't actually sell it. 
and we know that other countries are doing this and we can see already the impacts that, that it would have. So Scotland, uh, back in May 2018, it uh, introduced its MEP, you know, it's set at the level of 50p per 8 grams, which is to do with the way uh, standard drinks are, are measured there. And even in the short time from May 2018, they've seen that um, there's the lowest rate of alcohol consumption in Scotland for 25 years. And there was a 3% reduction in the alcohol sales there compared with a 2% increase in England and Wales. They've already seen some early indications of a, a reduction in hospital emissions for liver disease uh, just over that, that, um, that, that one and a half year period. <clears throat> And given, I suppose, working on that and seeing that success, um, MEP has now been introduced in Wales and also in Jersey just this year. Now, I know this isn't um, necessarily going to have an immediate impact on uh, cancer at, at this point, but to be able to see any reduction in the level of alcohol consumption, hopefully down the years, you would then begin to see uh, a, a reduction in, in cancer rates that might come from that. There also, um, say, MEP has been tried in a number of different places in, uh, in Australia. Uh, it was introduced also back in, in 2018. And again, you can see there, there's been quite a number of significant reductions, whether you're talking about assaults or injuries or attendance at, at ED, and indeed from the family home situation. This, this is a measure, it's a proven measure, which can actually have results. So where are we here in Ireland? Uh, we're, we're, we're 650 days and, and counting since uh, MEP was legislated for, but it's still not, actually not commenced. And you can just see at a glance there from our own uh, price survey, these are the sorts of prices that you can get alcohol for at the moment. So like 45 cents uh, for a drink of cider, which under MEP would actually go to one euro. And we ask, and you're trying to say, well, how can we actually make this happen? You know, throughout 2019, uh, there was a number of announcements uh, from the then Minister for Health, Simon Harris, and from then Taoiseach, Leo Varadkar, that uh, MEP was imminent any day now, before the next month, and by the end of the year, we kept hearing this, but I'm afraid nothing happened. In June 2020, and uh, I, again, I, I'm just thinking here of what Fenton said, um, if it's not in a program for government, you're not at the races at all. So thankfully, and we did work very hard to make sure of this, um, the, the program for government did give a commitment to, to the introduction of the MEP, but said that it wanted to do this in conjunction with a similar move in, in Northern Ireland. And to be fair, in July uh, 2020, there, um, there was a consultation was announced by the Minister for Health there, Robin Swan, and asked to be held within a year. Um, I have to say my heart sinks a little bit uh, when I see that consultation. I think, you know, really, really, do we need any more discussion about this? Um, and our, you know, really determined view would be we should just go ahead with it. We don't need to wait for Northern Ireland. And really, you know, there's many other implications about, you know, cross-border trade. It's not just about MEP at all. There's different VAT rates, there's different exchange rates. You know, to have MEP in the north or not have it really is not a reason to, to delay bringing it in here in the south. Moving on to uh, some of the other areas within the, the, the Alcohol uh, Act. Um, we would say that we absolutely have to tackle what I would call the lifestyle myths. Uh, what, the, what the alcohol industry would tell us is that basically every occasion is a drinking occasion. And I say that's backed up with a marketing spend of the order of a trillion dollars. And basically, I would say that here in Ireland, we have unfettered opportunities for marketing. It doesn't matter whether you're on your screen or whether you're out in the street, you know, or whether you're watching on, on the TV or whether you're actually at a game you will find references to alcohol will come up on, on every possible occasion. Um, we can see this just as say in this, you know, the, the, the lifestyle dream that, that would be out there. Um, the very much the emphasis on the sociability, you know, it doesn't matter whether we're talking about a gardening festival or whether we're talking about sports um, sponsorship or championships that would be there. This centrality of alcohol to our existence is something that has been fed by the alcohol industry. It's not something that is necessarily inherent to us. It is something that has been fed by the, the, the marketing um, expertise of the industry. So what can PHAA do about this? So one of, one of the uh, central areas of um, the Act was to say that there has to be regulation on the content, that you cannot be selling this, as I say, this dream. So the ad itself has to give specific information about the product. That's really all it can say, where it's from, a description of the taste, its price. 
But another huge element of this regulation of content is that the ads must contain health warnings and in particular cancer causing and they also have to give a link to, to public information about this through the, the HSE ASP but the whole site. As I say, not yet commenced. Another element of the, the Act is labelling, and I would really put this down to, you know, our, a, a consumer's right to know. So some of the things that um, the, the, the warnings that will now have to be put on alcohol products, um, both on the product itself and at the point of sale, would be things like a warning about the, the danger of alcohol consumption, a uh, warning about alcohol consumption during pregnancy, um, a little bit of information about um, the energy and the grams uh, of alcohol in, in, the, in, in the product. But a very particular one, which is relevant to our, our talk today, is about to warn the public about the direct link between alcohol and fatal cancers. And this would be a worldwide legislative first. So we have it in the legislation. What we haven't yet got is commencement of, of this particular set of warnings. Where are we with this labeling? Well, in order for uh, the labeling to happen, the Department of, uh, of Health has to publish what's called secondary legislation, which would be about well, what do these labels look like? What's the size and what's the font? What's the color? What's the positioning? Then these regulations have to be notified back to the European Commission for review. Um, and there's a standstill period after that where in which any country can object. If, and I have to say this is a massive if, if it is ratified by the EU, then there's another three year transition period. So before it actually, you know, would, you'd see it on, on the shelves. So it's a very, very lengthy process. And as I say, we haven't even seen the secondary legislation at, at this stage. We're aware when we look around the world and what else is happening that, um, you know, labeling is a very, very big issue. At the moment, only one of five countries in, uh, in, in the European region of the WHO have any kind of legislation on uh, the nutritional values, so that's like the calories. And I was interested again, actually, when Donald was talking about, you know, with, with obesity and you know, alcohol is this linking factor in so many things between whether we're talking about obesity or whether we're talking about um, smoking, because actually there's links there. If you're drinking, you're more likely to, to, to smoke a bit more. Um, the empty calories are more likely to lead to, to, to weight gain. And, you know, alcohol, um, Donald, I know you were, you were given out, you were saying how the, the industry has, um, you know, stymied so many approaches about, um, you know, giving proper information. But at least I will say that, you know, your, your, your Mars bar does actually tell you many calories are within it. Right now, an alcohol product doesn't tell you that. And um, so we're very, very far behind, you know, on, on the curve on this. So other studies, where what else can, can we learn from around the world? Um, I mentioned that our legislation uh, is, is a first, um, but there was an experiment carried out um, in relation to putting cancer warnings on alcohol products. This was done in, in Canada back in 2017 in the, in the Yukon. And over a period of, um, of a few weeks, there was um, a set of warnings that were you know, put out on alcohol products. So they gave you know, a warning about it causes cancer, it gave information about the level of alcohol that was in that particular container, and giving you information about you know, low risk levels of, of alcohol consumption. And uh, shortly there, um, there was a, a fantastic report came out from that, uh, from that, that experiment. And it's just, it's so positive because basically, if you saw the label, you were more likely to remember what the label said than what, than, than in a comparison liquor store where the, the labels weren't used. The sales of the labeled product, they dropped by just over 6%, while the sales of unlabeled products, they rose by almost 7%. Sadly, however, after a few weeks of that experiment being run, uh, industry progress led to the cancer warning labels being abandoned. So we, we got no, no further information on that. Um, a few weeks ago uh, in uh, Australia and New Zealand, um, they passed uh, legislation for mandatory warnings. Now, this is just in relation to pregnancy and alcohol, but I, I have to tell you that that legislation itself took nearly 20 years to get through. And if you look at um, what, what has finally been agreed and what will come up, so the, the, the picture just there on the, the left is the agreed label that would be there. And if you look at the picture on the right, this is what the industry actually wanted. So, you know, to try and make that that, um, that, that warning as, uh, as, as minuscule as possible and as least likely to actually be able to be seen. So this is something that we are very aware, of. We, we, we were certainly working with our colleagues in Australia and New Zealand about 
all the kind of the tricks that I would say that, that the industry will be looking to do. So that the font size, the color that will be in, in, in play, these are all areas that, um, that they will be pushing forward to, to, to minimize at, at, at every possible angle. So where are our opportunities? What else uh, can we be doing? Um, many of you know will be familiar with um, Europe's Beating Cancer Plan, and that's due to be published um, at the, by the end of the year. And we would see this as an absolute opportunity. But for us, what we would say, and I'm sure <laughs> in the agreement here amongst us all, is that um, to beat cancer, what do we really need? We need prevention measures. And those prevention measures need to be at the centre of any such plan. And of course, we would be saying from an alcohol point of view that restrictions and the, the kind of measures that we know can work around alcohol um, control, that's what has to be put into that plan. Um, if you're interested, there is a, a webinar, our colleagues in Eurocare, which is a, an amalgam of a number of different um, uh, NGOs such as ourselves across Europe, are running a webinar on alcohol and cancer. And actually, Maria McGuinness is due to speak at that. Um, I, I gather there's an announcement today about where Maria is, is actually going to be going. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll wait to see. Hopefully, we'll, we'll, we'll see what she's actually there but certainly if you have a chance to, to have any impact or any uh, input into that plan we would really encourage you to, get to, to try and do that. Uh, I'd like to end on a few positives. Um, some elements of the PHAA have actually been introduced. Um, you may now notice that you don't see outdoor ads uh, within 200 metres of schools or playgrounds uh, for alcohol. So that was actually introduced um, in November 2019. Um, you don't see it on public transport um, uh, or on um, the, the, you know, the waiting bays um, for, for buses or Lewis or trains or whatever. And uh, coming this November, there will be the, the introduction of um, separation and reduced visibility of, of alcohol products in, in supermarkets. So you can look out for that one as, as well. Um, some of my more pessimistic colleagues will say, is that just wind dressing? Um, I'm grateful that there's something that's actually there. Uh, it, it, it does show that if you keep going, if you keep pushing, you, you will get some sort, sorts of changes. But we know that the proposals that have the most potential to lead to a reduction in alcohol are things like the pricing, the restriction on alcohol content and labeling. These are the things that are absolutely vital to do. Um, I'd say right now, it's a right to know. 87% um, of the population don't know that alcohol causes cancer. We can save lives and we can do it by implementing the PHAA fully and absolutely. In order to do that, we need to be working together. I know um, and my colleagues are, are so, so grateful to everybody who helped uh, in getting together the PHAA to get it through it, particularly through the Alcohol Health Alliance Ireland, uh, our, uh, a grouping of about uh, nearly 50 organizations and individuals. It really works when we work together. So I'm delighted to be here to be, to be a part of this network and hopefully we can lead to a change in our alcohol consumption in Ireland. Thanks very much. Thanks for that, Sheila. Um, it's much appreciated. And I'd just like to remind everyone again, um, well, I'll ask uh, my colleague Oni Ling to start to share her screen. If you could just stop sharing yours there, Sheila. And um, I'll just remind everyone again, just from the last few presentations, if you have any um, questions, if you add them there to the questions and answers, and um, Sheila will be joining us on the panel um, at the end as well. Um, and I'll hand over to my colleague now, who's uh, Oni Ling, who's our Cancer Prevention Officer in the National Cancer Control Programme, and who's going to give you some more information about the Irish Cancer Prevention Network. Can we just check we can hear you okay, Oni? Yeah, so can you see my screen okay? And I can see your screen, that's super over to you. Perfect. Um, so as Trina said, um, I work at the National Cancer Control Programme, I'm the Cancer Prevention Officer there. Uh, today, I am speaking on behalf of the Irish Cancer Prevention Network, which you've probably guessed and it's been drilled into. The network has been established um, by the four uh, organisations, the Marie Keating Foundation, Breakthrough Cancer Research, ourselves, the National Cancer Control Programme and the Irish Cancer Society. And it's very much so a collaborative approach to, to cancer prevention in Ireland. Now, our four previous speakers have outlined that cancer is preventable. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is how can we enable this and um, try and ensure that we do reduce cancers um, in the future. Um, so what I'm hoping uh, by the end of uh, my talk today, um, you'll have taken two, two messages home. One, what is the Irish Cancer Prevention Network? 
and two, that you'll take us up on our call to action. So the Irish Cancer Prevention Network, it's a group of organisations with an interest in cancer prevention working together to reduce cancer risk for the people of Ireland. And I think what's come across from our four speakers is the importance of that working together um, to really reinforce behaviours that can reduce cancer risk for the people of Ireland. And what I hope you do at the end of this webinar is one, that you sign up to future ICPN correspondence via the post webinar survey, which will be sent out to you. Once you respond to that survey, you'll also be sent um, resources that we've developed. Um, and the other call to action is if you've got any specific cancer prevention queries, if you're running any initiatives, be them public awareness, um, environmental, behavioral, or if you're doing any research in relation to cancer prevention, that you would contact us and inform us about what you are doing so that we can try and support um, your future work and really grow this network. Now, I'm going to take a bit of an opportunity as well. I know we've been probably on this for a couple of hours, that if you are sitting down and you haven't moved yet, just to stand up and move around. We we're spending the, the couple of hours talking about cancer prevention, and one of the, the messages is uh, physical activity can reduce your risk. So I'd really encourage you, your cameras are off, just to stand up and move around um, while, while I'm speaking to you. So I'm going to tell you a little bit of the story of the Irish Cancer Prevention Network. Um, so going from the past, where we stand at the moment and where we hope to go in the future. So why, why have we established um, a cancer prevention network? It's already been outlined that about 30 to 40 percent of the cancers are relatable to modifiable risk factors. We know that in the National Cancer Strategy, um, it was outlined that cancer prevention will be a cornerstone. We know that there's a rising incidence of cancer. Um, we also know there's something that we can do in order to reduce some of those cases. We know that there is a number of cancer prevention initiatives already uh, established and that are ongoing. And if we can bring together a voice to support these, then we can reach to our public and really impact upon those behaviors. We also know that there's a wealth of information everywhere. Um, public knowledge is increasing, but we want to make sure that the knowledge that's been passed on to the general public, that it is evidence-based. We saw the impact um, that the HPV vaccine, um, when there is um, information put out through the press, through social media, um, and the decline um, in the vaccine. And then we saw the impact of the positive messaging in regards to how the HPV vaccine can reduce your cancer risk. Um, or we saw the impact again with increasing public knowledge with regards to smoking and hopefully we'll see it with regards to alcohol and cancer risk. So all the ICPN wants to do is make sure that information that's imparted to the public is evidence-based. So you know, building on all that, it was identified by the National Cancer Control Programme, the Murray Keating Foundation, the Irish Cancer Society and Breakthrough Cancer Research that we can really strengthen cancer prevention in Ireland by working together. So what did we do? Um, we knew there was a why. How have we gone about establishing the ICPN? So first of all, we looked internationally. We know that in Australia, um, there's great networks there uh, to support work. We saw an example in Alberta in Canada, um, which is a healthier together. And just across the water, we have the Scottish Cancer Prevention Network. We invited the Scottish Cancer Prevention Network over um, to give a talk and share their learning at the NCCP. And I know some of you who may be watching and listening to this attended um, that, that workshop. The picture you can see there is Professor Annie Anderson and Dr. Bob Steele. Um, and it is them that established the Scottish Cancer Prevention Network and came across um, and shared their learning. At the end of their talk, we held a workshop and we really wanted to see if there's an appetite for an ICPN. Um, and if we did establish an IC, the ICPN, what should the aim of the network be? What should the day-to-day -day fun day -day functioning include? And what would be the enablers and barriers um, to establishing such a network? After we looked internationally and Annie and Bob shared their learning, we moved to actually establishing the network. So the picture you can see there is of Dr. Jerome Coffey, the former director of the National Cancer Control Program, uh, Liz Yates, uh, CEO from the Marie Keating Foundation, uh, Orla Dolan on behalf of Breakthrough Cancer Research and Kevin O'Hagan from the Irish Cancer Society. And what we did is we drafted up a memorandum of understanding. And within that memorandum of understanding, we established what our aim was and what would be the objectives that we would try and, um, try and reach. 
we spent the first year really trying to learn how best to enhance collaborative work in between our organizations, how to ensure that there's shared ownership of the network, how best to coordinate it, and how to expand it so that we encompass all who have an interest in cancer prevention. One of the actions that we undertook was we um, put out an online consultation, which again, I know some of you responded to. And within that consultation, we just looked to see what are people interested in in relation to cancer prevention? Um, how would they like information shared or how would they like to be supported? Um, and one of the outcomes of it was that people were interested in a cancer prevention event. So we began to plan it. Um, originally it was planned face to face, but then in the context of COVID-19, it moved to an online event and that's where we are today. Um, so we took an action from that consultation and uh, putting it in place now. So where are we at present? Um, the ICPN, what is our aim? The aim of the network is to bring together collaborative working between organizations with consistent evidence-based cancer prevention initiatives to reduce the risk, for the, risk of cancer for the people of Ireland. So what, what does that mean? What are we actually going to do? So I mentioned about the memorandum of understanding and within that we set these objectives. Our first objective is always aligned with the national cancer strategy. We want to collaborate on cancer prevention initiatives in Ireland. We want to agree consistent evidence-based cancer prevention public awareness messages. We want to make sure that we disseminate up-to-date cancer prevention research. We want to support members and organizations in cancer prevention queries. We want to make sure that we facilitate peer learning and then we support national programs with a unified voice. So that's what, we're, what we've set out to do. So how are we actually going, to, going about this? And what I'm going to do is just give you examples under each of these objectives about what we've done in the past, what we're currently doing and what we want to do in the future. So our first objective is to align with the National Cancer Strategy. The first four recommendations in the cancer strategy are around cancer prevention. The first being that Healthy Ireland policies would be implemented in full and opportunities to address cancer prevention measures will be maximised within these. The purpose of the ICPN is to support, support the Healthy Ireland uh, policies and aid their implementation. The second recommendation is around the National Cancer Control Programme developing a cancer prevention function. What the ICPN does there is it enables this cancer prevention function um, to act, it acts as a conduit to make sure that information is, is transferred out to organisations and also it aids supporting organisations in their cancer prevention initiatives. The third recommendation is around developing a national skin cancer prevention plan and implementing it. We know that skin cancer is the most common cancer in Ireland. The ICPN was part of the group that drafted and published this first national plan and uh, they're part of the working group that are actually implementing this national uh, plan as well. In, in relation to that, the Irish Skin Foundation actually joined with the ICPN um, to aid the implementation of the, the skin cancer prevention plan because they have a particular interest in skin cancer prevention. And then the fourth recommendation in the strategy is about developing a systematic evidence-based mechanism to ascertain the potential benefits of cancer prevention programs. I suppose that's one of the items that we're launching today. I'm going to give you a contact point that if you do have cancer prevention queries, you can contact the ICPN and we can support you with these. Our second objective is to collaborate on cancer prevention initiatives in Ireland. We've done this in the past and so we hope to do it even more in the future. One of our main ones that we've worked together on is World Cancer Day, which is held at the beginning of February. You'll see there that we put a call out of Bring a Friend to Park Run. So we collaborated with Park Run and looked to get the message out there that physical activity decreases your cancer, cancer risk. And also that it, it, it aids with um, uh, managing a, a healthy weight. The first year we did it, Park Run actually had the highest attendance um, of all year on that weekend. What we've done over the couple of years is we all attended the same Park Run or we attended our local Park Runs and really just promoted that message. We've collaborated with the Healthy Ireland Sun Smart program. So we're really trying to get that message out there and the impact upon behaviours that reduce skin cancer risk. So you may have heard of the slip, slop, slap, seek and slide. What the ICPN has done there, it has aided the development of partner packs, which have been sent out to target groups, be it outdoor workers, children and young people, or those who pursue outdoor leisure. And it contributes to developing initiatives um, to impact upon sun safe behaviours. We also have the ICPN shared calendar. It's a simple enough tool 
where we all, all the organisations share what cancer prevention initiatives they're planning for the year. Um, this makes sure that we can support each other and also to ensure that we're not overlapping with our initiatives as we're competing for the same market. And what we hope in the future is that you'll start sharing your own cancer prevention initiatives. We can add these to the ICPN calendar so that we can support you in the work that you're also doing. Our third objective is around agreeing consistent evidence-based cancer prevention public awareness messages. We all, we turn on the news, we'll hear, we'll hear stuff like um, burnt toast uh, causes cancer, mobile phones. What we want to make sure is that evidence-based messages are provided to the public that are understandable and that they, their actions can be informed by, uh, by, by evidence. Internationally, there's codes, there's a lot of research done and you've, you've seen uh, with our four previous speakers, the evidence that's behind some behaviours which impact upon cancer risk. You've got the ECL, which is the European Cancer Leagues, and they've got a European code against cancer. You've got IARC, the International Research on Cancer. They have their handbooks of cancer prevention, and they also have their monographs on the identification of carcinogenic hazards to humans. And you've got the World Cancer Research Fund Continuous Update Project, which is continuously analyzing research on cancer prevention and survival. So we know that there's a strong body of research out there with regards to the behaviors that affect your cancer risk. What we want to do is make sure that these are contextualized for Ireland. So what we've done, and we'll share this with you after, provided you complete the online survey. We've developed the steps to reduce your cancer risk for the people of Ireland. You can see there's, there's things in there um, that affect not just cancer, but a lot of other chronic diseases. So we talk about body weight, physical activity, smoking. And then there's things that are specifically related to cancer risk. So things like UV exposure, uh, protect your skin from the sun, and never use sunbeds. You've got the, the mention of radon there as well. Um, there's radon impacts uh, upon your, your lung cancer risk. Within it, you'll also see breastfeeding. It reduces the mother's cancer, uh, breast cancer risk. Um, with alcohol, and Sheila has outlined this very well already, the impact upon alcohol and cancer risk. But one of the things that's probably not as well known is the relationship between alcohol and smoking. So alcohol aids the movement of cancer causing substances from cigarettes through the body, especially to the mouth, head and neck. So really don't smoke and drink alcohol together. We'll send this out to you. So these are the steps to reduce your cancer risk for the people of Ireland. And the second page of it, if you are interested in more information, provides the references for each of these lifestyle factors. So if you want to learn more about the mechanisms behind it, um, all you need to do is click on the link um, and you'll be able to, to find out more. Another of our objectives is to make sure that we disseminate up-to-date cancer prevention research and facilitate peer learning. So, so far what we have done is shared published research within our network through emails and our quarterly meetings. Like most recently, the World Cancer Report from IARC um, was, was published and it outlines research for cancer prevention and the mechanisms behind each of the uh, modifiable risk factors that affect cancer development. We're, today we're having our first webinar, so we're imparting the information and research that we know of um, with each of you who's listening. And this webinar has always been recorded, so we'll hopefully have a, an even further reach. And what we hope to do in the future is develop a newsletter, which we can share with you, um, and also organize more educational events to make sure that up-to-date cancer research, French and research is being shared and learned. One of our other objectives is we want to make sure we support members and organizations in cancer prevention queries. Uh, we linked a lot with Alcohol Ireland, Alcohol Action Ireland um, in the development of the um, alcohol bill. So we were able to provide research behind the relationship between alcohol and cancer to try and strengthen the work there. And what we want to do is if you or your, your organization are developing or currently running initiatives that affect, upon, affect cancer risk, that you can contact us at prevention at cancercontrol.ie if you've got any questions, if you need any support. And we're talking about things that are in relation to public awareness, um, anything that affects the environmental behaviours, um, or if you're undertaking any research in cancer prevention. I think for me, one of the most striking things when we're listening to these presentations is we rely a lot on data outside of Ireland, and we really do need to strengthen cancer prevention research. And finally, one of our other objectives is we want to support national programs with a unified voice. 
We're part of the Cancer Prevention Europe, which is, our, which is owned by IARC. Um, we became an affiliated member. And it just means that when they put out consultations or they're looking for information with regards, with regards to cancer prevention within Ireland, though we have a unified voice in the information that we, we provide back to them. We also want to make sure that we're supporting Irish programmes. So I already mentioned the Healthy Ireland SunSmart programme and that we get behind this consistent messaging um, and initiatives that can affect people's cancer risk. We'll also have gotten behind and we'll get behind again Mouth Cancer Awareness Day, which is the 16th of September, which is run by Mouth, Head and Neck, um, the Mouth, Head and Neck Cancer Awareness Group Ireland, um, which we'll keep an eye out for, for their information. But what we want to do is just make sure that we're supporting cancer prevention initiatives um, that have been run in Ireland. So the future, where are we going? What do we want to do? Hopefully I've given you a little bit of an outline of what we've done in the past, what we're currently doing in relation to our objectives and what we want to do now in the future. We really want to make sure that we continue to align with our identified objectives. Key, one of the, the actions from this webinar is we want to grow the network. I think when we were talking about it initially, I myself, I was expecting about 40, 50 people maybe to, to sign up. Um, I was quite taken aback when we had over 400 individuals sign up, which shows that there is a strong interest in cancer prevention. At the end of the day, we are all affected by cancer. And if we can actually do something to reduce cancer risk for the people that are around us, um, then all the better. What we'd hope is that you sign up to our newsletter via the post webinar survey. Um, as I said, when you complete that webinar survey, you'll also be sent out um, a copy of the steps to prevent cancer uh, that I've just shown you um, and also your CPD cert. And also we want to make sure that the ICPN has made the contact point for cancer prevention queries. So if you do have any questions that you can contact us. So the take home message, what is the ICPN? We're a group of organizations with an interest in cancer prevention working together to reduce cancer risk for the people of Ireland. And the call to action, Sign up to the future ICPN correspondence via the post webinar survey. And if you've got any cancer prevention queries or running any initiatives, as I said, awareness raising, behavioural change, or research, that you contact prevention at cancercontrol.ie. Thank you very much. Thanks, Anya. And um, just as you stop your screen sharing, then I'll just yeah, ask you to turn on your. Um, video and if the other panelists would mind switching on their video just to join us for the um, questions and answers session. So um, again just to remind people so we have our previous speakers Fenton Howell, Joan O'Shea, Sheila Gilhini, um, Anya Ling and Abby Collins and then we're also being joined by other members of the Cancer Prevention Network. Um, if you want to indicate who you are it's Kevin O'Hagan if you should see there from the Irish Cancer Society, Liz Yates from Ray Keating and um, oh, Orla has joined us now as well, Orla Dolan from Breakthrough Cancer Research. So um, you're all very welcome. We just need Abby to turn on her um, video and then we have everybody. Oh, we need Fenton as well. Have you been joined by Fenton yet on the panel? No, there we go, Abby. I'm yeah, just waiting. No. Oh, you're there as well, Fenton. Okay, just yeah, your I video. Just, I, I think <laughs> Helen, Helen needs to, un, to let me in on the video. Oh, right. <laughs> oh, your video is off at the minute. That's okay. Um, well, what we were going to, there have been quite a lot of questions and, um, and I'll try and feel as many as I can and, and maybe try and, and bring them together. There have been a couple, um, you're in now, Fenton, thanks for yeah. that. Um, a couple have been in relation to, I suppose, pricing and setting, you know, a, a government level price. And I was going to start with you, Fenton, in terms of um, you know, pricing for cigarettes and how do you decide, you know, what the optimum price is without forcing people into kind of the, the legal market, we'll say, and what's the strategy there? Well, they can never be dear enough. Yeah. <laughs> but I think what you, I, I think it's, don't get caught up in the wrong argument. You don't say, what's the right price strategy we should have to stop people from buying smuggled cigarettes. Smuggling cigarettes, illicit trade is a is a crime that we have to tackle in its own right in itself you shouldn't be saying let's not put the price of something else up in case something else happens that's not the way to go about it it's the wrong way to look at it what we have to do is eliminate illicit trade 
we know the industry is implicitly involved in the illicit trade, and that's why we have a framework convention on tobacco control with an illicit trade protocol. We have EU directives that deal with it as well, and we need to just bring that on board. Deal with the crime issue as a crime issue and not be trying to do some something on health so that people don't commit a crime. It's a, it's a crazy way of looking at things when we, we turn it around. Thanks, Vincent. And to Donald, I suppose there was a related question around um, the sugar sweetened beverage um, tax and the, the argument, again, similar to what um, Fenton said, the, the argument that, that comes up quite a lot in terms of, you know, targeting the poor and, you know, if you're, if you're um, you know, d d would you would you just like to comment again in terms of I suppose what you showed um, would would um, yeah, I, I, so I would echo what Penton says about you know the the when there was talk about a sugar sweetened drinks tax there was talk about driving a black market and driving a a, a kind of a, a smuggling around sugar sweetened drinks uh, so that argument is always going to be thrown out there but that really isn't uh, you deal with that separately uh, I think the uh, and it, it applies to smoking. The, the accusation that the sugar sweetened drinks tax is regressive in health terms, uh, in that it affects the lower socioeconomic uh, more than the better off, better educated. Um, so it does, but it's progressive. Uh, so it's regressive fiscally, in that it affects the less well off, less educated more, but it's progressive in health terms. Uh, because it will have a, a bigger impact on the group in society where obesity rates in children are still going up. So what we're seeing in obesity is a leveling off of our children, overweight and obesity rates are around the 20%, but it, that's disguising a continued rise in the less well-off, less educated parts of society while it's declining in the better off, better educated. So what we've got to do is use the money we generate from taxes like that to address the health inequality through the Healthy Ireland uh, framework and through the Sancho uh, Care programme. Thanks, Donald. And Sheila, I know you covered pricing quite a lot during your talk, really, so uh, would I be right in saying you're more at the stage of just making sure the minimum unit pricing gets gets implemented, isn't it? Yes, it is. But I I'd actually would concur as well because uh, with a couple of other things, and there's a, there was a question that was raised as well about um, alcohol-free um, uh, pricing or you know that, that the price of alcohol free wines and beers seem quite expensive and you know should we be pushing for a reduction in that and I actually think the whole pricing the whole strategy of the industry around pricing is incredibly interesting you know it's a it's a it's a massive big feature of of how they push their products so so yes we do see more um you know, alcohol-free products, that is good. I have no objection at all to that, but you have to also realize that in in promoting those products, you know, Heineken Light or Heineken Free or Heineken Zero, whatever, it, you know, is also promoting its brand at the same time. So there are plenty of alcohol-free drinks. There's water, you know, that, that, that is available. I don't think we have to be pushing for a lowering of prices of alcohol-free beers or you know, around that. And again, um, I think very much as Fenton was saying, we would see a similar argument about um, pricing that uh, that the industry puts forward, that there would be an increase in smuggling and uh, other cross-border trade, there would be problems with that. But actually, it's a total red herring because, you know, whatever alcohol is out there, it's being produced by somebody, it's, it's an industry who's, who's trying to push it. So we would, we would I'd be concurring. And it's just so interesting to see the same arguments coming up, whether you're talking about smoking or whether you're talking about, um, you know, uh, you know, unhealthy foods, it's that the, the same, the industries use the same tactics. And Sheila and um, Donald touched on kind of the disadvantaged communities there, and so particularly we you know we've made big strides in terms of smoking Fenton overall, but in terms of the the disadvantaged communities, but the question really is, is there more we can do to target the you know the the um, most disadvantaged in society in terms of smoking rates? Yeah, I think there is. Uh, we need to recognise it's a problem. That's the big thing. Uh, and, and concentrate on that. And we need to provide support. We need to deal with the two things. We need to deal with things at a population level, like some of the things that have happened, like the smoking ban, like price rises, like plain packaging, which almost takes the person out of it. And then at the other end of it, we need to make sure that where we can, we provide sports, supports targeted, like cessation supports, 
targeted at less well-off people. And, and, and that's happened because I remember back in 2011 when the uh, one and every two campaign was starting and I was chair of the group that was involved in that. And I had said to the PR people in the HSE at the time, look at, you can always get me a press release into the Irish Times and the Independent. The challenge I said, is to try and get coverage in the Sun, Mirror and Star. And that was the challenge that they took. And we also said, let's make sure that we put the ads on programmes that we don't necessarily watch ourselves, uh, that, you know, ones that I mightn't look at, so that if I don't see the ads on telly, I won't be too upset. But they're going to be targeted at the audience that we want to get at. And that's, that's important to do that and to recognise that that's a reality that we need to look at. Thanks, Fenton. And then in terms of, um, I suppose the education sector has, has been brought up, I mean, both in terms of actually the, the benefit or not of just educating people, we'll say, as to what the right thing to do is. And then also the education sector itself in terms of, particularly for children and obesity, Donal, um, I mean, one specific example was given of school lunchtimes being so short, you know, the fact that people bring convenience foods as opposed to having kind of a, a school day that was structured more around, you know, to facilitate a healthy lunch and a, and a bit more kind of um, and time. So do, do you have any comment in terms of how that kind of broader, not just the education in terms of telling children what to do, but also the school setting um, is being used um, to tackle the obesity problem? I mean, the the Irish, or the International Congress on Obesity was um, in our virtually in Dublin last week, and and Tim Lobstein from the uh, WHO said that, that we have exhausted the school setting, and almost um, optimized what we can do. So we we can never stop trying within the school setting, uh, but there are more than two thousand studies uh, showing that the potential for any further impact uh, is limited. So you, you, you cannot, you, you have to keep trying, but I'm not sure that there is massive uh, scope for doing more in the school setting. And I think the COVID-19 uh, uh, environment is going to radically change our school environment uh, as regards um, eating, uh, lunches, uh, and, and that environment. And we have to track that very carefully because the food and drinks industry are already very far advanced in their planning for the COVID-19 environment uh, in terms of how they can get more children eating more processed uh, foods more often because that's their job. We have to acknowledge that's their job um, and we have to fight it. Um, and brand management, which was mentioned earlier, you know, the, the best example of that for me is, is the fruit uh, that, that McDonald's uh, sell. And they use it to freely advertise in children's uh, broadcasting time. But it's exclusively to brand management. It is not to sell fruit. So I think we need to be very careful. I think the school environment is very important. Uh, but the evidence that introducing uh, more change there is highly effective as regards weight uh, is actually limited. Uh, we're trying to accumulate it, uh, but Tim Lobstein's point last week from the WHO is, you know, how many studies do you need to show that there is minimal effect and it's short-lived to keep flogging that particular area? And uh, Liz, if you want to come in there, just... yeah? Sorry, if I could just add uh, to Donald's point there, uh, the Marie Keating Foundation has a, a schools cancer awareness program, which we run in secondary schools throughout uh, the country. And essentially it's identifying those modifiable risk factors and outlining to school kids um, in a very interactive fashion, how smoking, alcohol, exercise, body weight, diet, nutrition, etc., has an impact in relation to cancer because there's a, as, as somebody said before, there's a huge lack of awareness um, in relation to other modifiable risk factors other than smoking, I think, in relation to uh, cancer risk. So this is a program which we carry out free of charge um, to secondary schools and it's available um, in eight modules to 
we approximately would reach about 81 or 82 schools every year, but we could broaden that reach. Um, and we're constantly updating the programme in terms of the evidence base and the association with the risk factor as well. So um, just to get the word out there, I mean, obviously, any school is, is um, you know, we are, we're, we'd, be de we'd be delighted to bring that programme to any secondary school that would be, and we can deliver it by webinar as well as uh, in person. As in our new way of working, yes. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Liz. Um, can I just move on to HPV? There are a couple of questions, Abby, around, I mean, just a practical ones, I suppose, in terms of school delivered vaccines and people wanting to check how their children finished courses and, and that. Um, in terms of checking that, is that something their GP has access to or um, where no, is that information held? It would generally be the school's information offices, so the CHO areas um, from the HSE services would generally be able to provide that information. And in terms of obviously a lot of the school kind of vaccination programs have been heavily disrupted with the schools being closed through COVID-19. Mm -hmm. um, so there are plans um, to make sure that people uh, or the children are caught up with those vaccines who consented in to receive those vaccines. So, um, you know, if your first year, um, if your first year vaccination program was disrupted through COVID-19, you should get information through about catch up for that for the girls and boys for HPV and all the other vaccines and um, in terms of sort of broader catch ups in general they don't do broader catch up campaigns you can consent in to the first year and after that if you choose not to consent in then in general there isn't a catch up campaign if people want the vaccine then they then have to pay privately for that there was a catch up campaign um, over the period where there was concern with the low uptake of the vaccine and, and a lot of the sort of media around it so I know that they had a catch up campaign at that point but I think that is now closed and it's just working on the new first years again and I suppose a lot of that is to do with capacity and ability to get around the 4,000 schools by the school teams to, to do that to you know they have a very slick operationally organized approach um, so you know if it's COVID-19 you'll be informed of how to catch up or you can contact your CHO office on the HSE website hpv.ie has huge amounts of that sort of operational information to find out if you have a specific query there's probably already an FAQ up there um, around it and um, so it's worth checking that out or, or ring your local CHO office. And just to clarify in terms of the programme for boys and there isn't a catch-up programme for older boys then? No, that's right. So it, it didn't come in with a recommendation to have a catch-up programme through um, NIAC. There are processes to sort of go through the sort of immunisation committee and um, recommends it, then it goes to um, the Department of Health and they'll agree it or not. And then the HSE operationally deliver what's requested of them. So there was no catch-up campaign for boys um, requested. It was just to start vaccinating the boys. Thanks, Abby. Um, there were quite a few questions around e-cigarettes. I'll try and roll them into the into the one question, really. I mean, one is whether there is any evidence around um, linkage with cancer, um, whether they can be used as an aid to smoking cessation and whether they should be banned. So um, I'll open that one. But if you want to comment first, Benton. I would. I said no, yes and no. Yeah. So what were my questions again? <laughs> so what I would say is we really have to not let the tail wag the dog here. 3,000 people died last year from cancers due to smoking. They died the year before, 3,000 will die next year, the year after, and the year after. Yes, e-cigarettes are an important issue, but let's put it into perspective. Less than 1% of the population who don't smoke or are not ex-smokers use them. Unfortunately, some people spend their energy chasing the tail and not the dog. We have to deal with smoking rates in this country. We have to try and help smokers quit. Ideally, people will use what we would call the best smoking cessation things available to us. But bear in mind, even with the best will in the world, with the best service in the world, you have a failure rate of 85%. That's worse than actually some of our worst cancers. So only 15% of people who use the best age will be quit at the end of the year. And if you sex that to five years, it will be less again. Some smokers can find, some adult smokers can find e-cigarettes beneficial for them. I don't think we have any right, if we're concerned from a public health perspective of protecting people to withdraw that from them. 
Yes, we need to regulate them. Yes, we need to make sure kids don't use them, but don't lose sight of what the problem is. The problem is the consumption of combustible tobacco products. Thanks. Anyone else want to come in on that? Or I think that's that sums it up nicely. Um, we had another question around the, I suppose, the high risk group in terms of um, smokers in particular, and whether lung cancer screening is something that again you know, will be considered. So, I don't know, Abby, do you want to just comment briefly on that? Yeah, that's. It feels like a hard topic to give a brief answer. Yes, yeah, sorry, <laughs> answer too. Um, but I'll, I'll give it a go. I suppose there's two two components. One is what the evidence shows, and is there deemed enough evidence to show that uh, there is good effects and that that can be safely um, safely delivered? And some of the earlier studies, you know, showed difficulties in terms of sort of repeat CT scans and invasive procedures with significant side effects uh, and adverse consequences to that. There's more recently been a big trial done uh, in, in Europe which shows uh, nice effects and good reductions in mortality in that very high risk group uh, without some of those um, significant adverse sequelae to the same degree. Um, so, so the evidence is coming together I suppose quite nicely. It's then how you also deliver it then at population level and how you have a, a target, how you have your group identified of high risk smokers. And for most I suppose national screening programs you know they are they are fairly crude but there are there are ways that we can actually identify those people so it's all babies born for a newborn screening program it's sort of all women between the ages of um trying to get trying to agree who's a high risk and how you know what sort of smoking pack year history would put you into that high risk does it need to be sort of tailored by sort of family circumstances or family history and then where do we have that nice sort of denominator from we, we don't have a nice list from all the gp surgeries of these are the x people so to deliver that at population level um, would be tricky and would take some thought none of these things are impossible but it's not quite as simple as you know every newborn baby is registered they are they are easier to their or get your cohort into the screening program. Um, so uh, there's then the process that needs to happen and that has to go through the screening advisory committee. So it hasn't been brought to the national screening advisory committee yet. So that will be the process for it to go through to really look at that evidence and what it looks like in a population setting and how well that can be delivered. And then I suppose there are are the cons you know the the inevitable knock-on sort of consequences in terms of you need CT scanners you need radiologists you need surgeons so you know we need those people for treating those with active lung cancer we'll need more again to be treating those and um, who are uh, you know identified through the screening so it's quite a complex thing to put together at population level uh, and I don't think we're there yet but I, th I think there's there's a future to really look at that very carefully. Quick comment Katrina. Yeah, you sure, Fenton? If we spend 10% of the effort and money we're spending on talking about lung cancer screening and mass media campaigns to stop people smoking, we wouldn't have to spend the money on cancer screening. So let's get the priorities right. Absolutely. Yeah, always professional. I suppose one other thing to say is there's a huge scope, sorry, just coming in for early detection and we yeah. are very actively doing some work and ourselves with um, the cancer charities as well for early detection for lung cancer where you can make good improvements if you can get early stage diagnosis. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a whole swathe of work that goes with it, but I, I, I'm with you Fenton, prevention all the way. Yeah, and I suppose to go back to Fenton's point earlier about 3% of the spend being on, on yeah. prevention and given how much, you know, even in monetary terms, how much of the healthcare spend is on um, non-communicable uh, diseases. So I think I that's totally it. That because uh, I, I repeat, there is no money being spent on treatment of overweight and obesity in Ireland and everybody is saying prevention is the key. Prevention is a component, a really important component. You've got to treat the disease and uniquely amongst all the diseases that are being discussed, we're not treating uh, the obesity, the disease of obesity. And, and that's uh, will lead to less cancer, will lead to less uh, diabetes, less heart disease, slightly more alcoholism, actually, you have to face up to that. Um, but uh, you have to be treating the condition. Mm -hmm. And uh, we don't have time to go through all the questions that were submitted because we're pretty much out of time now. But I, just uh, to, to bring some of them together, a lot of them 
are talking about the um, the availability of services and supports within the community. So whether it's treatment or management of overweight and obesity, uh, smoking cessation, alcohol interventions, etc. So I think uh, similar to some of the things we mentioned today, a lot of those answers probably are in Sloan to Care, and the commitment is there in terms of of how it can happen. It's just just making sure that that does does proceed the, the way it's intended so you know the availability of those services in your local community and when that will happen um i think are unanswered questions now but it's not this that's not um agreed with everyone that that's that's a way forward and um, can i check if any of the panelists have any final comments I just very very quickly just just a, a little bit about education. Um, so from an alcohol point of view, um, we're, we're very happy that the HSE have put together a program, Know the School, which is uh, goes out into schools, and certainly much better that the HSE would be giving such a program rather than the alcohol industry uh, through through some of their methods. But I would say that you know education could never take the place of regulation and controls, and in fact, it would be an alcohol industry. Thing to try to point towards education as being a solution and to say it's all about trying to get individuals to change their individual behavior when in fact we're awash in the marketing and the myths of the industry and you cannot compare a one trillion dollar uh, global alcohol marketing campaign versus a public health campaign that we might run through healthy ireland so control is absolutely vital from a public health point of view thanks sheila and, and just, Kevin, just, very, just very quickly there, I just want to highlight, um, we're launching a lung cancer awareness campaign on Monday next, and it's really to kind of highlight the importance of, of early detection. Um, there's been a very significant decline in the number of, of people presenting at their, at their doctor um, with, with lung cancer symptoms and a lot of confusion perhaps with, with COVID-19 symptoms. So we have a campaign starting next Monday 14th, so maybe you'll, you'll see that and, and if you would share that. Um, information will be sent out uh, through the NCCP as well. So just to, to flag up that one. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Kevin. And Orla, I will just pass over to you as well for her comments. Um, I just wanted to thank everybody for their coming to the thing and for the actual speakers, but also to say that we kind of have a moment here. So we're doing this in a virtual way because of COVID, but COVID has also shown us the um, immense value of public health and the fragility of humans and the need for research and, and again, public health and that's value. So we have a time now where the public even, you know, sees that value and that's a moment we need to seize to channel it into the efforts that we're doing in cancer prevention because we need to advocate for more spend in that area in the long term not just during a crisis period we have today so thanks again to everybody for talking and participating thanks Orla we probably need to have a quick word from Liz just very quickly I mean I think we started with a note from the minister um, we heard about the, the fact that cancer prevention is an absolute cornerstone of the national cancer strategy um, we need further funding for cancer. You know, as, as Donald said, I think there's over uh, close to 6,000 deaths from cancer every year. We're at 1,700 for COVID. Yes, it is a public health pandemic, but we need our screening services to be fully resumed. We need full investment in the National Cancer Strategy, both for prevention as well as treatment and support and survivorship services. So I would put the... I would call on the government and the new government has a real opportunity here to make a mark to ensure that the goals of the National Cancer Strategy are implemented. And thank you again to all of you for being involved in supporting uh, our inaugural Cancer Prevention Network today. Thanks, Liz. And just to remind everybody, Oni gave details earlier of, of how to become more involved with the Cancer Prevention Network. And when we send out an evaluation form from today, um, we'll make sure that you're getting um, those details as well and how to view the talks from today as well. So uh, it just falls on me to thank all the speakers and the panellists and the members of the ICPN for today. Um, and to thank everybody for dialing in um, and joining us. I hope it was a, a useful event for everyone and we look forward to engaging with you again in the future. So we'll sign off now and wish you all a good day. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye now.